Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good to see everybody here. It's a beautiful evening and had a beautiful day today. At this time, I'd like to call a meeting of the city council to order. And uh, let me let me say a few things. Uh, we certainly want you to speak to any of the items on the agenda if you care to do that. Uh, I will. Where is that clock? <laughs> we, we do have some guidelines and I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, we, we've changed them just in the last couple of months and I'll just mention maybe two. There's the clock. Okay. Uh, council discussed, uh, we were in a situation at some point in time in the, back, in the, in the past where we had people kind of taking advantage of, of us and uh, and speaking more than once, speaking for 10 minutes, 15 minutes at some time, and we all like, we like to hear people speak. We want, we want our citizens to speak, of course. But it got to the point where we, we thought we would have to calm that down a little bit. So we have a, we have a five minute clock. You don't have to go five minutes, but it'll, it'll tell you. So it, it's just something that will help you, you know, with, with, your, with your comments. And if you would, just think about what you want to say, you know, and, and council felt like uh, most of the time you can work within that five minutes. However, there are times certainly when there'll be more than that. Presentations and if council wants to ask questions of the speaker and, and that kind of thing. So, but uh, it is a guideline uh, for you to, to enjoy as you speak. And, uh, so, just wanted to, to mention that. Um, if you do want to speak, raise your hand at the appropriate time, and that's usually after council has kind of finished talking, discussing an issue. Um, but raise your hand and come up to the podium, please, and give us your name and, and your address. That's all, all you have to do there. Okay, at this time, we're going to have an invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us this night, this very special night, as we embrace John Clem as our new city manager. Give him your blessings as he begins to serve the people of Aiken. Guide him to decisions in the best interest of our citizens as he deals with difficult issues to come. Help us to welcome him to our community and bestow upon him wisdom, strength, integrity, and courage as he begins his new job. Continue to bless our city, our staff, members of this council, and especially our public safety department who serve us and you in harm's way. We ask special blessings on members of the military who serve this country throughout the world. In your name we pray, amen. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Council, do we have any uh, additions or deletions to the agenda this evening? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like uh, uh, to get an update on the uh, Jim Lakes roads uh, at the appropriate time at the, during the uh, petition sections, please. And Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, ask that we, at the end of the meeting, that we go into executive session in order to discuss the north side recreation facility uh, information that Glenn has for us tonight. Okay. Just at the end of the meeting. You're going to discuss that at all? Uh, yeah, we could when the time comes. Yeah, okay. Okay, those two things. Fine. All right. Next item is uh, first item, really, of, of the minutes. Consideration of the minutes of regular meeting of April 13th, 2015. So we have a motion and a second for approval. So moved, Mr. Mayor. I second. Uh, discussion? Any discussion? If not, show hands, please. All in favor? Passes unanimously. Under presentations, we have three tonight. And the first is the oath of office uh, for city manager John Clem. Yes, 
doing it. Sarah, we'll go ahead. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John, we've said it a million times and everybody's said the same kinds of things. Thank you very much for being a city manager. We appreciate you very much and I look forward to working with you as you know. This is much, much as we possibly can and we will. Thank you, sir. Presentation two is proclamation regarding Lupus Awareness Month in May. And so Jade is, is here, okay. Lupus Awareness Month. Whereas lupus, an inflammatory disease that can cause severe damage to various parts of the body, skin, joints, and or organs inside the body, by the autoimmune system producing antibody cells within the body, leading to widespread inflammation and tissue damage, and belief that something is wrong. This is the part of the body that fights off viruses, bacteria, and germs. Whereas it is estimated that many as 1.5 million people in the United States are living with lupus, 90% of people diagnosed with the disease are women in childbearing years, and as many as one in, two, one in 250 people may develop lupus. And whereas the city of Aiken calls attention to the need for people locally across South Carolina and around the world to unite in support of individual families, friends, and communities affected by this disease financially, physically, socially, and emotionally, and to renew our commitment to finding a cure and improving their well-being and quality of life. Whereas we support crowning lupus by participating in and promoting the observance 215 theme, crowning lupus. And whereas Lupus Awareness Month encourages all citizens to learn more about lupus and the four different types, systemic lupus, or the metallosis, thank you. <laughs> Uh, discord lupus, skin only, drug in induced lupus, temporary, national lupus, neonatal lupus, occurring at birth, infant, eventually grows out of it, and work together to raise awareness of this silent epidemic and treatment of lupus among the residents of the city, state, and around the world. 
Now therefore, I, Fred B. Kavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Aiken, South Carolina, and City Council, do hereby proclaim May 2015 as Lupus Awareness Month <coughs> and Saturday, May 2nd, 2015 as the second Aiken Lupus Walk in the City of Aiken and urge our citizens to recognize and participate in these observances presented this April 27th. We just want to give you this offer for recognizing um, to you and the other members on the cabinet for recognizing May as Lupus Awareness Month. Okay. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, my name is Jay Nilius, as he said. My organization is Crown and Lupus. We serve over over about 500 people. Not only do we serve the citizens of Aiken County, but we also serve the citizens across South Carolina, and we are also the CSRA. Um, we just started endowments and scholarship for those families who can afford medical, insurance, um, to travel to different engagements. Our commitment is to them and to make sure that no lupus survivor in Aiken County or South Carolina for that matter will ever have to be in a situation where they cannot afford their medication, where they cannot receive treatment, and where they cannot get the assistance and the, the care that they need, whether it's physically, emotionally, socially, professionally, financially. Um, myself, as a, being a, an 11 year lupus survivor as of March 15th, it is just my goal to one day, well, I'll be saying instead of we're finding the cure, we have a cure. But until then, I will continue saying run lupus, don't let it run you. <laughs> I'd like to um, personally thank um, Jade Needless for her efforts for creating this foundation. Um, Jade is an amazing young lady, even though she has the worst form of lupus. Jade never quits. Sometimes she's in the hospital, not able to do anything for herself. But she goes on, and she's pursued a master's degree at the University of South Carolina. She organized this walk last year and had over 300 people out at Odell Weeks for the walk. And uh, Mayor Kavanaugh walked with us. And as a lupus survivor, I thank you for being a source of encouragement for people all over this county that are suffering with any type of rheumatoid and autoimmune disorder. I thank you very much. And I will see you Saturday. <laughs> okay, item number three is another proclamation regarding Fair Housing Month. Who is, is no here? One. Nobody here? I could just All right. mention it. Huh? You want me to just... no, I, t I tell you what, let, 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 me, let me read it. Try to do a little bit better job than I did last time. <laughs> I'm not promising anything. <clears throat> Fair Housing Month. Whereas April 2015 marks the 47th anniversary of the passage of the U.S. Fair Housing Law, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, as amended. Whereas the law indicates a na national policy of fair housing without regard to race, color, creed, national, national origin, sex, familiarity, and status, and handicap, and encourages fair housing opportunities for all citizens. And whereas through the years we have made great strides in opening housing markets, giving all Americans an equal opportunity to live wherever they choose. And whereas housing discrimination, although less obvious and persuasive than years past, still exists. Whereas the City of Aiken, as well as the Aiken Board of Realtors, are committed to highlight the Fair Housing Law, Title VIII, the Civil Rights Act, 1968, by continuing to address discrimination in our community, to support programs that will educate the public about the right to equal housing opportunities, and to plan partnerships, efforts with other organizations to help every American of their right to fair housing. Now therefore, city, 
Council of the City of Aiken, South Carolina, to hereby designate Fair Housing Month in Aiken and ask that all citizens support this law to ensure fair housing for everyone. Under all business, the first item is approval of appointments and discussion of appointees to various city boards, commissions, and committees. Mr. Leduc, please. Yes, sir. We have five appointments for tonight. They're all by Council Member Omoki. Uh, the reappointment of Sharon Brown to the Arts Commission, Regina Brackett to the Accommodation Tax Committee, Martin Buckley to the Building Code Appeals Committee, <coughs> John Horvath to the Housing Authority, and Linda Lucas to the Senior Commission. So for your consideration tonight, we'd like to have Council consider appointing these people. Okay, do we have a motion and a second for approval? Mr. Mayor, I approve the nominations of Mayor Pro Tem made. Okay, I'll second it. Any discussion? If not, show hands. Pass, passes unanimously. How about uh, nominations for our next meeting? I have one, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I'd like to appoint Daniel Moody to uh, replace Robert Aaron on the Recreation Commission who has recently resigned. Okay, thank you. Any others? I have one, Doris uh, Begley for the Arts Commission. And uh, those two will appear on the next agenda. For, for voting purposes. <clears throat> Item two, second reading and public hearing of an ordinance amending section 230-35 of the city code regarding schedule for city council elections. Mr. LeDuc, please. Yes, sir, I'm gonna read this by its title only. It's an ordinance amending section 235 of the Aiken City Code by revising the time for filing nomination petitions, holding primaries or conventions, entry of candidates for nomination in municipal party primaries or conventions, closing of entries and election of members of the city council and making related amendments thereto. Uh, this year is an election year for council. We have three positions that are open. Uh, we have also given you the dates as to when uh, we would be opening up those nominations, which is July 6th, and when the closing, which is about a week later. And so for your consideration tonight, we are asking council to approve the amendments that we have in this ordinance. Okay, so do we have a, a motion to second? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. Discussion? I don't know. Uh, Andy, as representative of the party, do you want to say anything? Okay. Okay. Right. Show pass, please. Oh, okay. Passes unanimous. Okay. do that. <laughs> Item three, uh, first reading of an ordinance to adopt a hospitality tax. Mr. Leduc. Yes, sir. Uh, again, I'll read this by its title. It's an ordinance amending Chapter 38 of the Code of the City of Aiken to adopt the local hospitality tax. For the last several months, Council has discussed ways that we could help the economy here in Aiken. Uh, you have come up with a number of suggestions. We have met on, I believe it's three, maybe four different occasions talking about the hospitality tax. And before you tonight is the first reading of this. Uh, we feel that the hospitality tax will raise about $1.2 million you have in the agenda package, uh, balanced budget of the revenue that be received and how this would be expended as per the state law. It does open up funding that can then be used from the general fund for several of the items that you have um, talked about. One is the consideration of hiring an individual that would help existing businesses and new businesses in the future. Uh, it would also give retail assistance for uh, coming up with data that would again help uh, existing businesses further develop the business they have or that data could be used if we felt a new business would be important to this community. The individual would be working very closely with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I would believe that the individual as they wake up day 
after day, they would be thinking next thing about how do we get more businesses here, how do we improve the businesses here, how do we go ahead and get more people to come to Aiken, to live to Aiken and enjoy the quality of life that we have here in Aiken. Additionally, you had asked that funding would be set aside to improve some of our storm drainage and water and streets, uh, again, to assist businesses in difficult areas uh, that in the past primarily were in the county. Uh, as I was taking our new city manager down Whiskey Road, and I would point out from Pine Log Road south to Talatha Church Road, about 60% or more of the areas on either side of Whiskey are not in the city of Aiken. And so this be, again, an incentive that council can use to help bring some of these businesses and help create new businesses there. But it's not just on Whiskey, it's on Pine Log, it's on Richland, it's on the bypass, it's throughout the city of Aiken. Uh, additionally, there would be money set aside for business license relief. Uh, so as new businesses want to come to the city, 100% of the business license would be rebated back to them in the first year, 67% the second year, 33% the third year, to help businesses, especially in the initial period of time, uh, establish themselves. And lastly, we have funding in here so that council has new business, uh, whether it be incubator type business, uh, businesses that you feel could be assisted by council, um, using money for tax credits, uh, whether it be historic or again tax credits to help a business uh, that would be coming to the, our community. You have some funds that would be set aside that as that happens during the year, you could go ahead and use these funds to assist a new or existing business that might be expanding. So all together, there are a lot of opportunities here. Uh, and lastly, for decades, we've been talking about the issue of parking in the downtown. Uh, I recall about five years ago, meeting with just about every merchant on Richland and Lawrence and the parking problems that we had. And the fact that it's, there is no additional parking available unless you are willing to walk that one to two blocks. Uh, we talked for years about how do we get more parking? Do we buy lots and make surface parking? Do we create a parking garage? Uh, and we kept looking a block to two blocks away from the downtown, and the concern was that people are not gonna walk that one to two blocks to the merchants, and even the employees would not be doing that. Uh, we have an opportunity of, we believe, of acquiring some property in the downtown area where a public parking garage could be placed, and so there is money in here to help assist with that parking garage. So all together, we have tried to meet the concerns that council has to earmark funds for economic development in the future. And so for your consideration tonight, this is first reading of an ordinance to adopt a local hospitality tax in the city of Aiken and upon your consideration and approval, a second reading and final hearing will be held at the next meeting. Okay, thank, thank you, sir. Is anyone in the audience would like to speak on this subject? Yes, ma'am, come on. <clears throat> come up here, please. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, my name is Ann Dix. I stay at 314 Chihashi Drive, Aiken, South Carolina. I just have a couple of questions. If you will look on page 67, the first article, where it says that the local hospitality tax not to exceed 2% on the gross proceeds of sales of prepared meals and beverages and establishes the manner in which such taxes may be imposed. The question that I have here is that I thought it was a 1% tax. Is this the way you're saying that when you put this 2% in that the council could raise it another percent without having to come back? Okay. 
Ma'am, all I was doing when I wrote the ordinance mm -hmm. was reciting what the state law said. Okay. And the, the state law allows municipalities to have up to 2 percent, but the ordinance at this point makes it clear that they're only asking for 1 percent. That's not to say they couldn't come back in the future and, and try to raise it to 2 percent, but what's before council right now is a 1 percent okay. tax. Okay. Uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, as I was reading this, it said for prepared foods uh, that it would be raised. And I guess my, my problem here is we just raised the tax 1% for school. Uh, that was in March, so we went to 8%. Now we're going to 9%. Now as I go about and see a lot of senior citizens maybe do one meal at prepared places, which is cheaper than sometimes cooking. And I guess that we need to, I hope you have thought about how that will impact people who may be on fixed, com fixed income, whether it's two married couples or whatever it is, and what they do is that, I guess when I think of a hospitality tax, is I think of it as someone who is coming from outside the city for the tourism and stuff, and they are paying that tax. But that also affects the residents who live within the city of Aiken. And I don't want us to become a city that's tax, tax, that cooks us up. After a while, we'd be 10%, 12%, the bigger cities up in that. So I guess my thing is I want us to think of those who are l less able to be able to afford that. And I understand the things that we have, and I guess one question I'd like to also ask if you were talking about the stagnation, I'd like to see that report where it has been investigated that Aiken is business growth is stagnant. Does anyone have that report? The chamber, um, the chamber would have can it. provide that to you, and David Jamison is in the audience along with It's on the website. It's on the website? Okay, thank you, Mr. Jamison, on that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just don't want us to get in the habit of just taxing our way out of that. I mean, you know, that's what the federal government tries to do. We need to look at sometimes maybe how we can reduce costs or how we can get businesses or get other people to come in, as you were talking about the parking lot. Can we get somebody to come in who would want to run the parking lot that they would get the proceeds for that? and then the people would not have to be taxed on that. Ms. Dex, I, I understand exactly. I'm sure we all understand what, what you're saying. And, uh, one of the things council has not wanted to do over the years, and uh, we'll go back 25 years, and that is have a property tax increase. We have not had one, you know, uh, in 25 years, and it may even be 26. And uh, I think we, I think we really do as much as we can with that money to not not overspend or or not um, get so much money, you know, that we can do anything and everything because we can't. We had a point in time right now, anyway, that that we can. And um, so, the, and the other thing is, uh, um, we don't have any debt in our city. No debt. I, I don't know. I don't know any. That's a good thing. Huh? I said that's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing, and we've worked. <laughs> we've we've worked hard to get there. Uh, that's my point. Rather than have go out and get a bond issue, have debt. <clears throat> Rather than have property tax increase. Have you ever thought about giving refunds to the citizens? Uh, so you know this. This is a <laughs> nobody likes taxes, of course. <laughs> but I just wanted to let you know that the that we have worked very hard over the years to, oh, to okay. uh, And the other question I have on this, I, I see that it is in a separate fund, so I do appreciate you doing that, but it's not co-mingled, so I do appreciate that. The other thing is um, who decides what projects this gets fit? This is something that would come back, the council would present, yes. and everybody would have a chance to speak on those projects. Correct. Oh, yes. Every, every project will be approved by council before we go forward with it, either in a budgetary process 
or <coughs> as an individual case entity. Case. And would we allow citizens input? Absolutely. Will we identify those yes. projects? Absolutely. Uh, just, a, just a question, Roger, because you've given us pages of a sample budget. Is that No, all this that is the is? actual budget. Okay, so we're approving projects tonight. No, no. no. It'll be at the next meeting. Okay. It's not going to change, but this, this is the budget that you're this receiving next Tuesday. Okay, thank you. And let me um, reiterate uh, something that the mayor said, and I feel frankly about the same as you about taxes. No one that I know of enjoys taxes. Um, there comes a time, though, that you have to uh, face some reality where the rubber meets the road. And certainly when you look at the chamber's study, the question comes, do we remain stagnant? or do we implement some things to spark growth? And when you look at pos the possibilities of giving folks an incentive to bring businesses in, small businesses in, okay. and diversifying those businesses, number one, the jobs that are created with those businesses, and the growth of our community, all of these things, frankly, has led me to believe, and with my vote tonight, that I will support this. I don't like taxes, but this one, I support. Okay. And if I could just echo once, probably I should have said this in the very beginning. Uh, council has looked at several other things, and one of the things was raising taxes to get an equivalent amount of money in. We had had to raise our millage to all the businesses and all the homeowners and on vehicles and boats and everything else by 7.5 mills. 60% of this will come from outside the city of Aiken. So it, it raises the money we would like to see needed for economic development, but it's coming from primarily those outside the city, instead of it, it being a burden just on the city alone. Oh, okay. So, so folks from the county coming right. in. Okay. Correct. And visitors. Mm -hmm. And this is just for the city of Aiken? Correct. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. How much is a mill, Roger? Do you know offhand? Uh, where is Kim? Kim, do you remember what a mill is? $150,000. Okay, thanks. And then let me just add, you've raised valid concerns, I'm sure, that others are having in this community, and we thank you for bringing those concerns to our attention. But okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, and we hope you come back and we do identify those projects and, 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 and voice your opinion. <laughs> I know you will. <laughs> we thank you for always staying on top of things. It is on top of it. Anyone else would like to speak? Okay, over here, then here. Mr. Mayor, Mayor, Council, Bob Besley, 733 West Rolling Wood Road in County Hills. I've been a resident of Aiken about 30 years now. Not only employed here in, uh, by the city of Aiken, but also in private industry. I speak to you tonight as a resident, as I am opposed to this plan that you have tonight and to this project. Um, I'm not opposed to, though, uh, expansion and the ideas that you have and the things that we need in the city of Aiken. I know the city of council has always been a good steward of my tax dollar. I I'm confident of that. But I'm, I'm against this because uh, the Bestley household, we eat out nearly every meal every day. It's the way that my family lives, my wife and I, because we're very, very busy. And then also my daughter, we eat out most every meal. I feel that I'm being unjustly taxed, and I, I disagree with, and I, I, I've never, would never call anybody uh, anything less than truthful, but I would love to see the statistics that would show 60% of the meals were accommodated, or excuse me, eaten by people outside the city of Aiken. Um, that would be very interesting to see the facts and, and data on that. I did, though, last night make a reservation for Chattanooga, Tennessee, for this summer. And in making that reservation, I was astounded at the tax of a nearly 15% that they charge on hotels and motels in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but they also break it down. And they have a very specific accommodations tax of nearly 8% that they're charging. My question to you is, can we look outside of the box just a little bit and see if maybe there's a way that we can increase it on truly the visitors to the city of Aiken and make up that tax loss um, rather than charging the people that are gonna be eating food in our restaurants 
I mean, I can just imagine somebody's going to come up with the idea that, hey, I can go eat at Bobby's Barbecue rather than eating somewhere else for that 1%. And while we think that's ludicrous, it's less than just maybe 5 or 10 cents on your dinner bill, I have a feeling that people will do that. So I do think it would affect uh, our local restaurants in different areas here. Um, and last but not least, I would love to see uh, us let the voters decide rather than our council. Let our voters decide if this is the way they want to go. You are leading us in the right direction. I think that you've got a good idea here, but I'd love to see the voters actually decide on this. We have, as this young lady mentioned before, we've had a capital project sales tax in the last few years. We've had a school tax, and now you're opposing another tax to the people that do live here in the city of Aiken. All I ask you to do as a good steward of our money is just to think about it again, and is there a way through potentially a, a raised accommodation tax to offset this? Thank you. Bob, don't forget the, the, the big tax we've had on, on projects. Yes, sir. Uh, that was voted on by the citizens. Yes, sir. Across the county. Correct. So that's not something council did. Absolutely. All by, all by no, sir, absolutely agree. And if we hadn't done that, you know what would happen? I understand that, and we needed that money, Mayor. I'm just saying as we go forward, maybe we should let and consider the taxpayers actually make that decision and not put that all on your shoulders. Well, That's all I ask. Just to consider okay, that. Okay. Thank you. Um, to answer your two questions, we had the hospitality tax at one time. When we did institute it, we saw no reduction in the sales at the restaurants. Number two, the accommodation tax is controlled by the state, and it's a maximum 3%. Where are we currently now? Three percent. Three percent. But it's it's we cannot go any higher. Right. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Bye. I'm great by you. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thanks, sir. Good evening. My name is Stephen Mueller. I live at uh, 221 Greenville Street here in Aiken. I believe that it is safe to say that the majority of Aiken citizens appreciate their city, enjoy sharing it with visitors, and would be delighted to see it evolve rather than stagnate while protecting its unique charm. Most people would also be willing to step up and support thoughtful growth if the long-term consensual plans was made transparent. We seem not even to be able to agree on the bike path. Um, I, for one, support tourism because real numbers show that it is the number one industry in the state and that its guided growth benefits all people in all parts of the city. Growth is always essential, but I don't believe consensus exists regarding a long-term growth plan. The comprehensive plan was devised as a guide for the city many years ago by the planning department with wide citizen input, but is rarely referred to. The local hospitality act of 97 was created with the idea of collecting money from tourists to spend on six specific purposes with the objective to generate more tourists. I am on the accommodations tax committee. In addition to the four separate taxes imposed on overnight accommodations, the city adds another 3% to the bill. Our committee awards a half a million dollars a year to nonprofit applications to generate more tourists. Tourists are defined as those traveling to Aiken from outside a 50 mile radius. Using various definitions of tourists to fit the situation would not be a transparent path forward. Aspects of speedily imposing another city tax will have large ramifications that should be further, first further discussed. Voting for a one cent tax on prepared meals and beverages is problematical. Less than 30% of the 270 municipalities in South Carolina 
collect more than $100,000. Initiative to move the city along is a good thing. However, a more methodical plan would be preferred over acting with haste as if Aiken was in a crisis. Voting for this new tax that will never go away, primarily as a revenue source for one currently discussed large project, which clearly does not enjoy widespread approval, would be short-sighted. This will clearly be a tax for locals. Another tax for my business, and it would be harmful. However, I would be inclined to support the tax after a lengthy discussion about the objectives and manner of how the money should be spent in the future that will result in more tourists spending more money in Aiken. It is fundamentally inaccurate to suggest that 60% of this tax would be paid by visitors. The number is more like 25%. Citizens eating a hot dog at the pool hall and drinking iced tea at the delicatessen would pay more money forevermore without understanding how it specifically benefits them. I ask that you postpone today's vote. The case for a new tax could be made more clearly. Stephen, thank you very much. You've made some excellent points. Thank you. Thanks, thank Stephen. you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, Council Members, uh, my name is Charlie Hartz. I live at 175 Adamsville Spring Road in North Augusta, so I do not live here in Aiken. Uh, however, I represent uh, several uh, Dunkin' Donuts here in Aiken. I already pay the 1% sales tax or hospitality tax in North Augusta, uh, and they seem to be good stewards of that income and, and are moving their city forward. Uh, I am the last one to vote for a tax increase. However, I would much prefer that those in this room spend my tax dollars than anybody from the state or from Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's clear from the, the Chamber's report that, that the city is not moving forward. Um, and I would prefer that as a group of elected officials, we, we, we plan that movement forward mm -hmm. versus waiting to see what happens. Mm -hmm. Even though I got to collect the tax from my customers, I support it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Richard, yes. Mr. Mayor. Hmm? Jane Page Thompson, 240 Knox Avenue. Um, the Chamber of Commerce's report that keeps getting referred to tonight bothered me from a real estate standpoint. And I went and looked at those numbers pretty hard, and I think I had some conversations with people in this room and also at county council level. That comparison that was being made to the loss of growth in Aiken City by comparison to North Augusta and Columbia County is where that big red number on that report came from. So if you look at the growth that they've been going through in the last three years, it's very similar to what Aiken was like in sort of 98 to 2004, you know, that sort of, oh my gosh, Woodside took off and we got bigger. And you all were very wise stewards back then. You didn't rush to judgment. You let the citizens vote on things. And I think that that's a great um, suggestion, is to let the citizens vote. I think that Mrs. Dix brought up some great points about um, the cost that's going to be borne by those who can't afford this tax. And I was thinking about wait staff. I was in a place that has one of these taxes that's relatively new, and the people I was sitting there with, and I won't mention names, said, oh well, we won't tip 15, 18, 20 percent. We'll just leave a flat fee and they can work out all those pieces of the pie that get divvied up when it comes to the tax. So our wait staff are going to take this hit not the tourists that we hope are going to take this hit, but people who work very hard for very low wage, very long hours. They're going to take the hit in their tips on this tax. I hadn't even thought about those chickens I get 
you know, that are pre-prepared foods, those ones you get at Kroger and Fresh Market and Buy Low, they're already made, that's a prepared food. And people who buy one of those chickens because they're in a hurry, like Mr. Beth has said, that's a very good point. That's going to be taxed extra. So the residents are going to take this tax. And what people in Columbia County and North Augusta have found, and I've been working with a lot of people who rushed to move to North Augusta and rushed to move to Columbia two and three years ago, who are, guess what? They're moving back to Aiken Estates and Gem Lakes because the taxes are going up over there. The taxes are going up really high in Columbia County because they got to pay for infrastructure, they got to pay for roads, and they got to pay for sewer and water and schools, and their taxes are going up. North Augusta, they already have their hospitality tax. I talked to a restaurant owner over there. His breakfast business on Sunday mornings has fallen off by about 50% because it's a delta. I was at a meeting not too long ago. A couple of you all were there. Most of those people out of 120 people told me they aren't going to eat in the city of Aiken anymore if they have to pay more taxes to do so. So while the Chamber of Commerce report did what it needed to do, and what that Chamber of Commerce report needed to do was to convince all of us to go to the ballot box in November and vote for the one cent make sense. Because that's what it was supposed to do. And we let that one cent pass because it was the right thing to do at the right time. I opposed it the first time. They repackaged it. They came back and it was the right thing to do at the right time. And it was a good thing. But it's only been in place for a little under two months. And now you're going to take another part another swipe at what our school board could get for the new infrastructure for schools. It's almost like you need to hold off and let the tax we just voted on in November that this just got implemented on March 1st, take hold, take root. Be the leaders that foster that change first and maybe postpone a hospitality tax until the seed that was planted with the school board tax takes root and the citizens who are having to rebudget and the businesses that are having to recalculate can actually take that time to do that. If a parking garage is a big thing, we're all sitting in a really great room that could easily be taken away. You don't have to buy a new property. You already own this building and you can build your garage here. I'm not sure why you need to acquire a new property. There are other options to think about than to rush to judgment because of a report that had a totally different political purpose. And I also encourage you to think about the fact that businesses in this community are pretty taxed, not just from you with the potential of the hospitality tax, but with the school tax, with their city taxes, their county taxes. But that unemployment tax increase in South Carolina really got people. And a lot of the financial businesses, lawyers, People who deal with anybody in the mortgage business, I'm sure Gary Smith can tell you what his office is going through, to implement the new financial regulation changes. A lot of lawyers are having to redo their software. Banks are having to redo their software. Real estate companies are having to put in safes. I mean, we're having to do a lot of things to comply with a new federal regulation that's really hitting our businesses pretty hard. So I'm encouraging you all to, um, to reconsider this tax at a different time. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I may, it's been, it's yes. been mentioned a couple of times. I just wanted to clarify. Sure. Um, state law mandates how the tax, ha the hospitality tax, has to be passed if council desires to pass a tax, uh, and that requires an ordinance of city council. State law does not allow this to be submitted to the public as a referendum. Well, uh, it, it could be submitted to the voters for a referendum. Would you agree with that? No, sir. No. The the, the uh, section, and I don't mean to I don't mean to disagree, but section six one seven twenty of the uh, state law says a local governing body may impose by ordinance a local hospitality tax not to exceed two percent of the charges for food and beverages. So it, it's very clear that an ordinance has to be passed. Oh, I, I no, I understand that, but we could we could put an issue to the ballot if we wanted to to ask the voters what they think about a hospitality tax. That's not what state law says. No, <laughs> we're, we're mixing words. We can ask the we can ask the citizens what whether they would approve or disapprove. We have to pass it, but we could get an input from them, much as we're getting an input tonight. You know, the, citizens, the citizens would not be able to vote to adopt a hospitality tax. 
All right. Well, council has to council has to make that. I vote. understand the council has to has to bite the bullet. <clears throat> okay. Does anyone else like to speak? Yes, sir. That's okay. Take your time. <laughs> My name is Howard E. Hillman, and I want to thank council for listening a little bit, and the mayor. Uh, I, I've read your printout here, and in my economic training, you have some, a few things that don't quite come out right. Now, for instance, if I have a restaurant in town right now and somebody's coming in with a restaurant and you, through your generosity, help that business, you are now discriminating against an existing business. Now, in my economic training, when we were talking about different types of businesses back in college, which is a long time ago, we took into consideration the taxation in the community, how we're going to set up our business, where we're going to have it in the community, and we have a concern of parking. And that is no connection to the local government. That is a personal business decision. And so what I'm saying is maybe your 1% tax will discourage a business from coming especially a takeout business, a pizza parlor, a, a food business, or whatever. So you might have diminishing returns on your tax. And plus, we'll be paying for it. It's fun to spend other people's money, but it, it's, it's got to be done with discretion and good sense. You are the people elected to take care of the finances of our town here, for instance. And therefore, you are responsible for making as great a decision as you can. Taxes do not encourage business, no matter how you do it. Now, if you take, uh, I have an example for you, I won't name the place, a local place granted tax abatement to a fairly large company. It was very substantial. And th then they gave development money, like you're talking about, Maybe not as, yours isn't as great as what they got. They got millions of dollars. They got their tax abatements, they got their building help with their building, they got help with their parking lots, and in two years they were gone. So you got to consider that also when you're investing taxpayers or other people's money what are you going to have in longevity in any business? So I thank you for your time. <coughs> thank, thank, thank you, you sir. sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Richard. Mayor Cavanaugh and members of the city council and to the citizen of the city of Aiken, listening to the discussion on this 
hospitality tax, I, I personally think that the 1% hospitality tax is a preferred tax. Personally, I prefer that over raising property tax. Raising property tax, that, <coughs> that confines the, the, the area to just the citizen of the city of Aiken with the 1% hospitality tax that broadens it out. So I would suggest that, uh, well, I would prefer the 1% sales tax as, as opposed to raising property tax. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay. We have one over here, Mr. Mayor. Okay. It's taken her a lot of courage to do that, so I'm <laughs> glad she's coming. Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council members, my name is Maria Kritzis. I live at 3061 Hackamore Drive in Warrenville. However, I own a couple of pizza on Richland Avenue. I did not plan to speak tonight, but um, I had three phone calls Friday. They were from my customers, and the first thing they asked me was if my business was in the city of Aiken. <coughs> and when I told them yes, they said, I enjoyed your food for, one was five years, another one was like seven years but I'm not gonna be coming to your business anymore. You need to step up and speak against this tax. We can't afford it. We just had one in March and it's too soon. So, like I said, I didn't plan to, but that was my personal experience. So please consider this, because these old businesses that have been here, they're going to suffer. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Anyone else? Elliot. Hmm? Elliot over there. Yes, Elliot? Sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Warm up the timer. <laughs> My name is Elliot Levy. I live at 150 Maxwell Road in Aiken, and I'm a retired person. <laughs> sort of, kind of. Uh, there's several things I wanted to mention. Um, number one, I took a course in college years ago that said how to lie with statistics. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and reports that have been done by University of South Carolina Aiken have been not the most accurate or, or even close to being accurate. Um, there's a, the governor of this state has said, she swore that she will not raise taxes on gasoline. And yet, in AARP magazine this month, it had a statement in there, South Carolina has the worst roads in the 48 contiguous states. But we're not gonna raise our state tax on gasoline consumption, or gasoline. Um, there's something else I wanted to mention about, it has been brought up about, about tourism and hospitality. We have in the, in the city and in the, in the county, we have these two departments, and they have the same labeling, parks, recreation, and tourism. I can see parks and recreation, but tourism is a major industry in South Carolina and throughout the world. It is a major industry. It may not be the salvation of everything that has to be done in the city of Aiken or in Aiken County, but tourism is not well taken care of or not not um, dealt with properly, I think. Um, I, I just want to mention this. There's an idea that, see, I have a wife, a wonderful wife, a unique person. My wife, about three years ago, took up this thing about running. She's never run before in her life. And she took this couch to 5K. Well, she's entered the last three years in this 5K race, and she's won for her age division, and which is wonderful. Yeah. And, but the thing is, my wife still is the same height, and the same weight, but now she runs and she, she has found that she can accomplish what she has in her body to make her a better or more fit person. We have a wonderful and unique city of Aiken. It is very special. 
People come here, they move here from all over the place to come to Aiken because it is special. It is a very unique thing. We all want to be unique. That's how businesses become successful is their uniqueness, that they, they have one niche. We have, an, we have something here in Aiken that nobody else has. We have a history, we have famous people that came here, we have a wonderful place to live, and we seem to want to bypass that so that we can have a quick fix of, of something else. Uh, by the way, lying with statistics, um, there has been a study also that um, the population of Aiken has gone down 320 people in the last two years. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, it's it's back to City Council for discussion. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have uh, several. Yeah, here's another person that wanted to speak. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else? If if there are, would you please go to that area over there, and we'll move on a little bit faster. Okay. It's uh, James Whittick, I'm 18 Brookline Drive in Hound Lake, Thanks. and uh, I read in the paper about this that for several months you've been asking staff to come up with expense cuts to fund this million two in projects. What's happened to that? Why are we not looking at ways to reduce our expenses rather than put the burden on the citizens to come up with more money out of their pockets after we just got hit up with a 1% tax, as others have said, back in February. That's one point. We are, we are working on that, by the way. We're looking, for, we're looking for ways that we can reduce, and in fact, we did. You're not getting the word out, and what expenses has staff come up with in the last <coughs> three to four years to cut ex expenses? Would you like to talk to Nancy? Sure. Okay, if you want to. <laughs> um, in the last two years' budget, we have not added any new personnel and in this budget coming up we have reduced personnel by five and a half individuals uh, along with several other projects that we had scheduled but we have cut back on but you're cutting back some but you're you're still higher than you were three or four years ago before the economic slowdown started and it was really in the I don't think that's true. Uh, that started in really seven and eight i don't believe so but I, I don't have those statistics like you might, so. Let, let, let's do remember one other thing that's happened over the last several years, and that is the reduction in personnel at the Savannah River site. That, that is true, that was terrible, as far as we're concerned, on revenue. Because an awful lot of those folks, maybe as much as 50, 50%, who knows, maybe more, lived in Aiken. And, and they have for years, this is the way it's been the best jobs and, and they and they they spent their money in Aiken and that, that kind of thing. So let's not forget that what right. what's and, happened to and us. And it's likely as well. that SRS's payroll will continue to drop. Not as dramatically, but I don't see that there's going to be big in increases in the payroll it's out there. Uh, they're, they're about ten thousand and I think they're saying that they Well I I, I want to echo Mr. Whittick's point ahead. because um, Go ahead. as it was a it was a comment that I made at the last council meeting. We have not reduced uh, our budget significantly since 2008 when the economy went down. We should have, we could have, but we didn't. Uh, it, it's pretty much stayed the same, it, minor ups and downs. In this most recent budget, um, we, we did save 100, over $100,000 in public safety. Uh, and I don't know the, uh, the amount from the other three and a, a two and a half positions that the city manager made uh, mentioned. Um, but my contention all along has been that we could have saved money from the existing budget to pay for some of this cost. So I support your, your comment. Okay. The, the other comment, uh, you know, talk about that, and, and I will disagree with uh, the city attorney. I don't see why there cannot be a referendum, advisory referendum held, give people the right to say, yes, council, go ahead and vote for this tax or no council, we don't want it, and you heed what the people do. We're not saying that the people are going to pass the tax, we're just going to say, we want to give, all of us want to give advice to you on this important issue. I don't think that's illegal. And then why, 
put the money in a parking garage to be used by a private business. That is well, not the, not the, the, the Aiken standard says that that's going to be, in a couple weeks ago, their article was that that was going to be used by the expanded Marriott Hotel on the corner of Lawrence and Richmond. That they will, they will have access to it, and their patrons will actually pay in their mm -hmm. hotel bill uh, a, and will a fee the city for that collect use. That money, yes, but that, uh, but it's not a parking garage for that hotel. The parking garage will be free and open to the public. You know, you go downtown to shop. Two o'clock in the afternoon, nine o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the afternoon, you can pull into that parking garage and park free and clear. It's not being built for any hotel. There, in fact, you know, the the issue of the parking garage is is there's a lot yet to resolve. That's not really tonight's topic. It, you know, it's in order to try to uh, to give an example of what this but money might be used for. But it's part of what you were for, planning on using that accommodation. As an example of what it's used for, for and, and if it were to pass, then it would be. But that's a separate vote for a separate day. But no, it's not being built for a single hotel or a single project at all. It's being built for all the people who enjoy and frequent downtown Aiken so they can park there free of charge and get conveniently to their destination, shop, and then return back to their car and go about their business. It's being built for the people of Aiken. That's not the coverage that you're getting in the well, press. That's, well, that's, that's the fact. I don't know what the paper said, but that's the fact. That I think the paper reported it pretty clearly, but maybe there was some ambiguous language. There was language. some ambiguity. Yeah, it was ambiguous. Right. It did look like it was going to be built to benefit the remodeled hotel. So again, I, I do oppose the tax. I, for one, will be like the lady was telling, I will take my eating out business outside of the city of Aiken once this tax passes and goes into play. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. What was your last name? Yeah. With it. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay. Now it's back to City Council. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I have some councils. Uh, I have a, a chart from the, from the past if Mr. Biedenbach could show that up. Uh, when we first started talking about uh, either a hospitality tax or a um, millage rate increase, we were talking about balancing the budget. From the previous discussions, it's my understanding that the hospitality tax doesn't balance our budget. I think that's a fair statement, or does it balance the budget? It, it could be used for that, if that's what you're asking. Are you, in other words, when, we pass, if, when and if we pass the 1% tax, does that balance our budget? Because we've been taking money out of the reserve funds now for three or four years in a row. So when the new budget's passed for next year, will we have to uh, take any money out of reserves? There is, if you want that exactly, I'll let you know. I don't need the exact number, but just it's about $300,000 that we'll be taking from our, our holding funds, and I believe it's $869,000 from our vehicle and depreciation funds. Uh, it's, at what point would we think that uh, the hospitality tax would, would cure our, our budget shortfall where we have to continue to take it out of reserves? And I've asked the question before, and uh, the hospitality tax is going to be fairly long term uh, getting those return investments, and that's just typically how business would be. My concern is in the next two or three years, if we continue to uh, use our budget, our, our budget reserves, it's getting pretty low. It's at about $2 million now. About closer to about 2.9 for the holding funds. The other one's around $10 million for the vehicles. I know, but the, the one that really counts is the reserve fund that we've right. put money in there for that. And, and we have averaged over $500,000 with additional revenue in that account every year. Over the last 10 years, that's been our average. And this year, we're looking at taking out around $300,000. Uh, how, uh, how does this hospitality tax help that $300,000 next year? So, with it, so that we didn't have There's not to a use. correlation between the two. Okay. Now, what but, but again, the hospitality tax could be used to offset uh, expenditures in the general fund 
and therefore it could be used to balance the budget, it could be used for economic development, it could be used for whatever council would like it to be used for in the future. All right, so the, as the budget you presented to us, will it uh, uh, overcome that $300,000 deficit, if you will, and, uh, and not have to take any money from reserve fund? We have always taken money from the holding funds. You know, we've added money to it, we take money out of it. It's the past several years we've been taking uh, more like seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000, and we're back down to where we have been in the past. Okay. All right. The, uh, the other part I didn't quite uh, understand, uh, we, uh, the, we put uh, $700,000 from the <coughs> hospitality tax into the general fund and then we take out 700000 back into the account. Is that where the balance of the budget comes in? So that's, that's how you show it on here. Again, what we have done is we have a standalone budget. It's called 014 hospitality tax. Uh, that has shows up $1.2 million coming in, and it lowered the amount of expenditures that we'd have to have in the general fund, which freed up money to be used for whatever council wanted to. In this case, we put that money in economic development. Okay. So we did help our, so the bottom line is we did help our budget by $700,000. That is correct. Okay. Uh, the chart up here, uh, I, I asked this to be done in, 19, uh, in 2012, and that is the general fund revenues uh, for about 20 years. I actually had it done for about 30 years, and until 2008, we always had an increase in budget uh, from Savannah River or increase in business or whatever it was. And if you look across where it's headed the last few years, and in this year's uh, budget, which is over June 30th of 2015, taking out the one-time money, we have about 26 uh, and three-quarter million dollars in our budget. And this year's budget has 1.8 million, what we call one-time money. It's the FEMA money left over, as well as some other things. And I guess this is what uh, concerns me in the long term. Uh, how can we get this turned up? And I assume. Uh, the hospitality tax, uh, the things we do with it are going to return our investment to take care of this, or is it going to mean that we have a millage increase in a couple of years? When, just the See if I understand exactly what you're asking. Uh, again, we transferred 700000 but we also have 500000 in the hospitality for a parking garage. So we are going to be raising $1.2 million in revenue. That revenue is being offset in the general fund. <clears throat> Theoretically, and again, the budget was set up and structured as to what we felt council wanted. But in essence, the $1.2 million from hospitality uh, could be used for whatever you'd want to offset that revenue gap if you wanted to do that in the future but that, that makes is, sense that is what it's meant to do i mean if if we do nothing that downtrend is likely to can continue downward and so the idea here is to is to invest you know, and, and you seek to get a return on investment it doesn't happen overnight as you've as you've made well stated but is to is to invest this money in the city so that we do get a return on investment and it returns that trend line in a more vertical direction, more like the red part than the blue part. Um, but you know, I, I think that's I think that's the the point. Is this about investing in the city and in the future? One, one of the things that you had mentioned, uh, Councilmember Ebner, was there's been a lot of debate on council over the last several months um, to take the blue line, which has been decreasing, and to get it to increase with revenue. Uh, one thought was raising the millage. You know, we, we talked about that. Uh, it would take 7.5 mils, as we said earlier, to equal that $1.2 million. But that, that is an alternative that council could look at uh, to increase revenue. I, I know there's been people that saying well, there's not even 25% of the people that eat that are visitors. The way that is defined in the state law Anybody who lives outside the city of Aiken is considered by the state as a tourist. That's what the, that's what the law is. That's exactly the wording in the law. 
And, excuse me, uh, so when we look at the 60%, those are individuals who live in the county, live out of state, live in other counties that come into the city limit to eat at the restaurants. And so therefore 60% we're looking at, and this, these are statistics that I've gotten from other cities had, have had the hospitality tax, uh, would be coming from the outside, not from individuals living inside the city. So it's, it's about a 60-40 split. Uh, but it's not visitors like you would think staying in a motel or a hotel. Uh, it would be individuals coming from outside the city limits itself. But to answer your question, this $1.2 million can raise that blue line up uh, in whatever manner council would like. Well, I think I think that's a long-term solution. And, and as, as uh, uh, the chamber and other businesses know, I've been promoting to get uh, some of the uh, properties that haven't been uh, so lately to get them done. I guess my concern is in the next three or four years, are we going to have to raise the millage rate to keep uh, keep our budget going? Because uh, you know, these investments will take several years to, to reap benefits, as we all know. And what I'm concerned about now is that we do we need to do this. I, don't, I think that's the right thing to do for the future. But uh, I don't want to be short-sighted. And in next budget year, we have to raise the millage rate uh, to keep the city uh, going like we are. I, I would agree with what you just said, Richie. And, and Reggie, and of course, we, that, we hope that we wouldn't have to do that. The, the, we, you know, uh, the numbers are against us, is all I'm well, saying. Well, it, it depends on uh, how many people moving to Aiken, how much they're spending, and you know, a lot of different things. We didn't think we could go 25 years, I don't think. Well, Did anybody I'm think not, that? I'm not sure we should have. Uh, <laughs> we know. Maybe we shouldn't. Yeah. But we, council didn't want to change it. We didn't yeah. want to. Put, we know that we're going to have we're Ex going to have some new facilities in the city of Aiken. We know we're yeah. going to have a senior senate. We're going to have a north side park. That's right. And that, according to what the Clemson people briefed us on, uh, could be as much as between five hundred thousand and a million dollars that needs to be added to our budget on the expense line. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing about the hospitality tax to me is it's too early. Um, it's too early because we don't know uh, as much as we need to know about the hotel. We don't know are we going to buy the land, is it going to be gifted, how much is it going to cost. We don't know the details of the garage. We're talking about all of these plans. Uh, the $1.2 is not going to be here until by, by the end of June of, of um, uh, 2016. Um, Mm -hmm. it, it's going to come in, I guess, if, if you believe the number, it's going to come in 100000 a month. Okay. Now, the, the county does not collect 900000 in sales tax, so the law says only 50% of this, of what we collect, can be used for tourism. I don't know what the other 50% can be used for. It doesn't say. Uh, maybe the city attorney can tell us when, before I get through or if he knows now. Let me make sure we're saying the same thing. It, it doesn't say for tourism. It says in a county in a county in which less than nine hundred thousand dollars in accommodations taxes is collected annually, pursuant to section twelve thirty six nine twenty, an amount not to exceed fifty percent of the revenue in the preceding fiscal year of the local hospitality tax authorized pursuant to this article may be used for the additional purposes provided at item one. And the purposes provided for in item one is uh, may be used for the operation and maintenance of those items above the tourism related buildings and that sort of thing including police fire protection emergency medical services mm -hmm. and emergency preparedness operations directly attendant to those facilities so that's it it limits 50 percent of the funds to be allowed to be used for the operation and maintenance of tourism related buildings cultural, recreational, or historic facilities. Uh, we don't have a beach. Uh, highways, roads, and streets providing access. Mm -hmm. um, advertising and promotion. Water and sewer infrastructure to serve tourism-related demand. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're looking at it primarily for uh, the garage, and we're looking at it for some water and sewer infrastructure that we desperately need and need to find the money from some, some source. It's very critical uh, that we do that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not going to have. We're going to collect this money sequentially as we begin the fiscal year, uh, when it goes into effect. So the idea that we're going to, we're going to have it that uh, that quickly, um, um, is, is not is not correct. Um, 
One thing for sure, the longer we hold out, the longer we don't do this, then it's going to be even later. So we I'm, need, I'm, we, I, in I, my I, view, we need to do this, and we need to do it as quickly as we can. And let's move it on. Tell me how this is going to increase beyond the 1.2 million. How is this going to increase the business in the city of Aiken? Well, you tell me. Well, you, I'm against the tax. You're for it. I, I, yes, I, yes, I am for it. So how is it going to increase the so business? There's a whole bunch of things that this money can be used for to good, for good reason. Uh, Mr. Mayor. And to make us, just a minute, just to make us move forward more than we do. We're sitting still right now. And nobody likes that. I'm not sure I agree <coughs> sitting still. I think we need to take a look at that chamber report, unless I'm misreading it. And I'm sure Friday I'll get some education on, the, on what the... Uh, Chamber feels the report says, but um, our business license tax revenue has increased every year since 08. Um, you know, we're, we're, just, well, we're just severely impacted with the site uh, manpower, Absolutely. half of whom don't even live in the county. But we're, that's the impact of the city. That's where, that's where we've been hurting through the years. When the, when the uh, site manning uh, goes down, we end up suffering the biggest pain, as opposed to the county, as opposed to North Augusta. That's right. So I, I, I just don't know how this is going to is this is going to uh, uh, help business. We seem to be doing a pretty good job. We got a, we, we got Cracker Barrel. We got uh, Longhorns. We've got a couple of hotels. We're gonna. I don't know whether uh, whether the uh, Aiken Hotel is dependent on the hospitality tax passing or not. Um, but we're we're getting a lot of businesses coming into the city as as we are. Mr. Mayor, I got a question. Uh, uh, Dick seems to, Mr. Doerr, seems to think it's axiomatic that if we vote for the uh, hospitality tax that it automatically includes the garage and so forth. Uh, regardless of whether it is or not, I think no matter what happens to the hotel and the parking lot, I think it's a good idea that we actually get the hospitality tax. Because if that deal falls through, I still think we need the uh, hospitality tax. So uh, I've heard a lot of arguments back and forth. And uh, a lot of people uh, seem to oppose the hospitality tax simply because they don't want to build a garage. They think the garage may be just uh, you know, for the benefit of a hotel instead of uh, serving the people downtown. And Mr. Mayor, I, I know Mr. Duar talked about the, the businesses that have uh, recently um, been added on the north, I mean on the south side, but we're still suffering here on the north side of town. There are things that the money could do to help the south, I mean the north side, see some growth, infrastructure issues and other uh, things that may, benefits that may attract businesses to this side of town. Absolutely. We gotta remember, south side is, is uh, doesn't need to grow anymore. I mean, it's <laughs> overgrown as it is. Traffic jams and nobody likes to travel over there certain times of day. North side is still suffering. Yeah, it is stagnant here on the north side. There have been a few additions. Our, our health center, mm -hmm. we've got the Houston Park, we've got north side, but we need businesses. Mm -hmm. We need businesses here on the, in, on the north side. And, 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 and there's and a severe shortage of infrastructure on the north side. Definitely, definitely. So how, would you, how would you expect this tax to add to the north side business climate? Maybe if we fix some of the infrastructure issues. There, um, there's a real lack of water and sewer service in a lot of parts of the north side, and, and there's, uh, there's, there's demand for, for certain, certain types of businesses and things on the north side, but you know, th those types of businesses need public sewer especially, but public water and sewer. Um, and, and that limits, that, you know, that changes the, the numbers and it limits the, the prospects of development. Now, there's other challenges there too. That's not all that's stopping, yeah. but, but that's one of the elements. And the retail strategy team that came in to brief us from that, that the chamber so gratefully um, um, promoted uh, indicated these businesses want to go where the money is, and the money is, unfortunately, whether you like it or not, on Whiskey Avenue, the South Side. Well, I mean, but there's there's businesses. I've, I've, I mean, I hate to use anecdotal examples, but I mean, I know, for instance, a uh, an owner of a fast food franchise that said that they've done all the uh, financial studies, 
and the north side is ideal for him for his business it is a perfect scenario for him and uh he, he had more complaints than just infrastructure but infrastructure was yeah. one of them um and so he said he's not he's not going to do it um i'd like to have the infrastructure in place and go back to him and say what about now would mr. you rethink it mr mayor yes uh-huh a lot of this discussion is is, is so familiar as i look at the growth in this town over the past 20, 25 years. I think of Citizens Park. And Roger has alluded to that, and the mayor has as well, uh, that that was a 4-3 vote. There were folks on this council that said that we're laying off 10,000 people. It's about Riverside. They weren't opposed to the expansion of Citizens Park. They just didn't think it was the right time because of 10,000 people being laid off. And I'm thankful that there were four people that had the fortitude to realize what Aiken would be like if we had not passed that at, at, at that time. The same holds true for the tennis courts that we have. And you know and I know the benefits that families have enjoyed as a result of some of those decisions that's been made. Certainly we are facing another, and that is this hospitality tax and what that will bring. The question is right now, do we want to wait until later or do it now? It's not a popular decision. I don't take pride in making this decision, but Mr. Mayor, I think it's the right thing to do at this time. And with that, I will make a motion to approve the hospitality tax. Second. Okay. Discussion? No I think we've discussion. had enough. <laughs> huh? I think we've had enough discussion. <laughs> enough Did discussion. Okay. Okay. See who stands with the people. All right, show of hands, please. All in the favor? Passes. Uh, well, that's for first. One. Just Dick, me? You're the one. Okay. <laughs> okay, passes. Six to six to one. Okay. Uh, Thank everybody for their comments, uh, and, and if, if, if we all know it's not an easy thing. We work very hard not to have tax increases in Aiken any more than necessary. Okay, under new business, uh, item one, development agreement with TD Bank Property at 2286 Whiskey Road. Yes, we'll do, yes, sir, this is a development agreement. Uh, I'm not too sure when's the last time we had an agreement like this, but it's a great instrument for council and the developer to use as we try to work through issues uh, on particular properties as far as who's going to supply what uh, to help a business locate in these particular areas. In this particular case, this is at uh, Whiskey Road. It's the TD Bank. Uh, we've talked about this uh, on more than one occasion. That property, Ladbridge property, Tire Kingdom is all in the county. Uh, one of the basic reasons it's in the county is because it last, lacks infrastructure. Infrastructure being uh, there's no stormwater, there's no sanitary sewer, uh, there's no good access to those areas. And so we've been working with TD Bank. I know that uh, Councilmember Ebner has also been working with them. And just this last week we put together this development agreement that would allow them uh, to purchase this property, this developer, uh, and convert it into more than one shop or possibly a restaurant. 
Uh, they have already performed the due diligence on a traffic study. Uh, they need sewer, and instead of them upfronting all the costs for the sewer, what we have done in the past is through these developers' agreement, in this case, bring the sewer from Athol or behind Cracker Barrel up to all the way to Lad Britt. They, in turn, would give us the easements. Uh, we would divide the cost uh, by three because there's three entities that will be using it. Uh, and they have, we have discussed with them helping to supply the sewer by reducing the cost for all three entities by 50000 We believe the cost, our estimates are coming in a little over 100000 uh, probably 110 is what we're guesstimating. Uh, it's not a guesstimate, it's an actually engineering estimate, which means that each customer then would pay $20,000. So you'll see in this developer's agreement where they would pay 20000 to receive sewer, the city would upfront through this economic development fund, fifty thousand uh, dollars. We are working with the property owner, uh, John George, George's Pond that we have behind uh, the Cracker Barrel. He would be giving us an easement to cross uh, Oak Grove, which is the road that uh, extends from Eastgate, uh, and get into the property at Tire Kingdom, then TD Bank, and then Lap Grit. So what they would like, and I believe they're here tonight, um, what they would like is Let's see if they are. either to preferably to have council approve this developer's agreement or at least to give them assurance that uh, this is the approach that we would like to take. Um, and if you have any changes, this is the time to make it so that we could continue to working with the developer. Their due diligence time to buy this property is getting very short and so a decision has to be made either tonight or at the next meeting um, if they're going to be able to go forward so they're they have given us the go ahead on this developer agreement we have worked with them and tonight we're asking council to approve the development agreement that's uh, in front of you with realty link llc for the proposed retail restaurant project located at the old td bank located at 2286 Whiskey Road, and with this, they would annex the property into the city of Bacon. Very good. Thank you, sir. Do we have a motion and a second? Yes, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Uh, I move that we approve this um, memorandum uh, and also uh, add to that that uh, the, the new city manager will keep us posted if we run into any problems. Uh, we sure don't want TD Bank to sit there for four years like another business down the street there or any others. So now that we've passed this economic development incentive in the city, we should have enough money to take care of these issues. And there's also a potential stormwater issue that we need to be sure that doesn't kill this deal either. So my motion is just uh, that we will vote to approve this tonight. Okay. I second. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Any any uh, discussion? Only that you're not going to get any hospitality tax money until after July. <laughs> well, and again, well, the sewer line would not. But be, we can borrow from the reserve fund. Well, we could do that. Also, the sewer line has a deadline to be installed by what was it December first, 2015. Right. I, so I then, need to remember the water and sewer account is getting an eight percent profit each year because of the the things we've been doing in the past. So we got 8% of uh, seven, eight million dollars that we can invest in this and still not hurt our water and sewer. Also at the next meeting, you would probably have another yeah, development agreement right. for John George. Um, we have the George's Pond. Uh, he has got some developers that are interested in his property that's also in the county. And so there would be a similar development agreement that we uh, have executed they have not seen it yet, um, and so we will be giving it to John George to look at and then bring it back to council. Again, laying out who would be paying for sewer, who would be paying for water, who would be doing the storm drainage, and how that infrastructure, and in that particular case, because the sewer, the water, and the storm drainage is right next to him, uh, there would probably be little or no cost to the city of Aiken. I think the original agreement with Mr. George uh, included uh, the use of, if you will, the George's detention pond for that purpose. Correct. Uh, this, the major reason we're putting together that development agreement is we have to cross around 150 feet of his property with an easement for the sewer line to get 
to oh, TD Bank. I'm, as, as I've told you, I'm all in favor of getting these memorandum of understandings, and I'm also looking well, it's one. It's very clear for everybody. And I'm also looking one for Teresa's, too. Correct. Very good. Okay. Uh, show of hands, all in favor? Passes unanimous. Item two is an update on capital project sales tax. Uh, back in January, uh, well, first of all, back in last fall, we hired Glenn Parker uh, to represent us on the capital project sales tax to manage that. Uh, in January, Glenn and I both together went through all the capital project sales tax items. It, we said about every three months we'd go ahead and make an update or a presentation to you. Uh, and I thought this would be ideal, especially with our new city manager, to hear about some of these projects. And so Glenn is here tonight to go ahead and give you an update. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be pretty brief with this tonight because uh, Philip has asked that we go into executive session and there are some things we need to discuss in there. I think you're, you're all aware of that. Just to let you know up front, the last two draws, talk about revenue first, the last two draws we've received have been above projection. Not enough above projection that we need to sit down and look at changing what you just discussed, repurposing, but they have gone up slightly. Now we'll get another draw May or June, and we'll just have to see. We just got our draw in, and this May draw is about 3% higher than it was last year okay. in May. So 1.368443.91. In case you want to know. <laughs> Here. Well, well, let's don't get overexcited. That's, we're, we're not. We're not. It's not, yeah, that's why I just said, you know, yeah. it's uh, not much of an increase because it was 1.3 something or other before. Mm -hmm. well, it's good news so, anyway. Yeah. But it's not below the projection. Is that's the important right. thing. No, it's not. At least it's not dropping off. Right. And, and what you'll see, what I'm going to basically do is just walk through the report that was in there. Since you approved repurposing at the last meeting, this is reflective of the end of March. So some of the things you've repurposed, you'll see that in your next month's okay. report. So I just want to point that out before we go on. Uh, Darty to Aiken Mall, that has been extremely frustrating for Roger and I. We have met with those folks on site. They flew down, they met with us. They seem very encouraged of what we want to do. They just will not come back to us. And by those folks, I guess I should clarify, I'm talking about the staff that owns the property that Publix is on. We just can't get them to say right now that they'll give us the use of that property to, to make our cut through. Uh, and I, I text her, or excuse me, I emailed her as late as today to try to get an update. Everything else is pretty much in place and ready to go. Street resurfacing, at the end of the report, there's a list of the upcoming street resurfacing projects. Uh, Hitchcock Woods erosion, uh, George and some of his staff and I met with Gene Eitzen. Uh, you guys approved a one-year extension to the work he's going to be doing. He really wants to focus on the railroad cut and determine how much water is going through the railroad cut into the woods. And then he'll come back to us. He's also talking about and looking at the possibility of vaults putting in to help retain some water to keep it out of the woods. What he's hearing from the initial phases of what he's done, people seem to like the bioswales that went in. They're not crazy about the rain gardens. So in future recommendations, I think coming from Dr. Eitzen, we'll see more, more potential bioswales. Uh, Roger just talked about George's Pond. The, the, the goal is uh, for engineering and utilities to have that done by the year's end. We'll talk about Northside Bike Pass. Uh, the DOT currently has the application. Uh, can you go back earlier? Yes, sir. Uh, on, on page uh, 98, can you talk about the underground utilities um, and full, full, final design complete for the alley? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, tell me if I'm on the right page. My understanding and what I've told people is that we have let out a contract for a company to design what we want to do with the alley and to tell us how much it's going to cost. Right. And that will be done. They had the second week of April, George and his staff had a 30% design meeting okay. just to make sure everybody was still on the same page as they're going through. I confirm with uh, Johnson LeShober Associates as of last week, they're on schedule. They'll have that report to us by the end of May. Okay. The, yeah, intent, the, other the intention would be that in June they'd come back the manager would come back to you uh, with an estimated cost of what it will take to underground the 
uh, utilities and to redo the stormwater, the water, and the sewer uh, before we take it to the go out for bids. Okay, well, I, I talked to one business owner, and it, it, it may have been unusual, but um, he wasn't aware of really. the process for doing the work in the alley and is worried about the effects on his business, um, worried about businesses in the alley. Um, it, it probably is not too early to kind of alleviate some of the concerns that the alley businesses may have um, if they know they're going to be open or closed. I mean, I, I, I agree we don't know what we're going to do in the alley yet until this report comes back. But if it's going to cause some businesses to slow down, I think of the poor Italian restaurant in South Park that had to close while they did that construction. And fortunately, for all and of us, it came the thing back. is, we do know what's going to happen. We do know that we're going to have to remove essentially all that asphalt that you see in the alley, about mm -hmm. 12 feet wide. And it's going to have to go down in some areas six to eight feet deep. Okay. Uh, we have been working with Avery. Uh, Spears Mahoney, mm -hmm. ADDA, uh, <coughs> several of the merchants there, I'm, I'm surprised that somebody doesn't know. Uh, we have all agreed that the best time to start this work is in the summer and to complete all the undergrounding and come up to the surface uh, well before Thanksgiving. So, because okay. Thanksgiving through Christmas time is very busy. And then any additional work that has to be done, the work above ground, uh, will be done after Christmas. Well, if all of that asphalt has got to come up, how are the businesses going to be allowed to operate? Okay, uh, think of it as a kind of like a slow moving train. We'll be digging up uh, for a week or two here. There'll be, you know, crosswalks and other things for people to get around and then fill it in, put some more in, fill it in, put some more in, so you'll continue. But you're still going to have trucks that supply the restaurants and, and the businesses. Oh, yeah. They'll, and we all have to accommodate that. Okay. But it's going to be up for a few months. It's going to be a mess. All right. I, I, my point is, I, and we may already have, I may have found the only business that didn't recall that they were briefed. And I, and I George uh, Gritton knows who I'm talking about. So um, I made a note. I'll check with Avery to just make I just sure she's contacted yeah. everybody. Yeah. And, and the other thing, because you skipped the bike pass and you went over another one, <laughs> I had a question on the school district apparently is not going to sell that building over by Eustace Park. We're going we're gonna to talk about that one in just a second. That's next. Yeah. Right? The, the plan as of last week when I spoke to Mr. Caver is they've decided they want to rehab that building. Their determination was it would take as much to, to rehab that building as it would to buy new property. Uh, so, so the plan is right now from the school district to stay where they are. What that does for us at Eustace Park, and I would encourage all of you to ride down there tomorrow. Haas and Hildebrand is going to go in tomorrow and stake the corners of where we feel like the building should go. So if you ride by tomorrow, you'll, you'll see that. They'll do that first thing in the morning, so you'll see that late afternoon. I think, uh, you know, we've got several things we've got to look at. We've got to look at uh, the LWCF grant that's tied to that property. My recommendation would be if, if we want to remove that, what we can do is if we buy land on the north side, then there's eight acres there, roughly eight acres at Eustace Park that's tied to the Land and Water Conservation Fund grant. We can move that to eight acres of this new property. Now, that being said, Land and Water Conservation has been in existence for 60 or 70 years, it's really changed over the years. And we've got uh, staff from the state PRT coming into town next Tuesday to take a look at that and see if see what they can do to help us out with that. They've worked with a lot of communities because the restrictions you have applied to that park are literally 40 years old. So you know everything has changed down there in, in 40 years. So we're gonna work with them to try to get that changed. Now, do you see laying that out as, um, it's a dumb question to say adequate, but when you lay it out, is that going to include what we would need for parking? No, sir. They're, they're only going to lay out the building at this point. In your estimate, how much more of beyond what they do in the building will we need for, for parking? This is the facility that's going to house 400 yeah. it, It's still pretty close with what we showed you on the original concept. One thing Mr. Caver and I did talk about is if they do choose to stay, he felt like the school board would be amenable to some type of, again, an MOU. <clears throat> 
where we could have access to their parking facilities after uh, they leave, which is around 3.30 in the afternoon. Okay. There's also a good bit of property uh, on the road in front of their building that's currently not being used. They haven't developed that property. It's just a wooded area. We may could use some of that as parking. Okay. Um, so those are the things we've got to work out down there. Uh, Kim Coleman is working with Council on Aging to look at the kitchen, what it needs to be. I, I've mentioned to you before, we may have a potential donor to give us uh, a good number of the supplies that we need in the kitchen. Uh, Let me just mention something about, there will be some memorandums of understanding developed uh, later this year. First of all, the architectural work will take most of the rest of the year to complete. And so construction won't start on that site till sometime in 2016. Meanwhile, we have been talking to Council on Aging, and again, until you get it in writing and those memorandums of agreement, but it appears that they would be willing to pretty much staff that building during the day. Uh, in the evening, we're working with the Salvation Army, Boys and, Girls. Boys and Girls Club, and they're discussing with us staffing it in the evenings, uh, which means that we hopefully will have very minimal staffing over there from city if we get these memorandums of agreements worked out. And Council on Aging, when you say morning, I'm talking they're about hoping the day. 5.30, oh, okay. 6 right. o'clock to open that building so folks could come in and walk and use the little fitness area early in the morning. <laughs> Too early it's to still eat. dark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before you leave that, uh, Ms. <clears throat> Ms. Price and I are watching over this very closely. She's mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, we need to stay on the schedule that we voted on and agreed to. So if that gets where it's not on schedule, the council <clears throat> needs to be aware of it and right. see why it's being held up because we're supposed to let the contract this year. And like Mr. We let the construction contract this year right. and begin right after the first of the year. Right. Like like he said, we'll have once the architect gets started, we'll do a thirty percent review, see where they are financially. Do we need to cut? Do we need to do whatever to keep us on in line? Three. I guess the other thing, uh, I guess somebody's talking to Betty Myers about these uses of the building. Uh, what we would do is tie up the building five days a week. With, with activities, so we, we need to be sure that the neighborhood has some interface on this. And, and Betty always calls me when there's a problem. She hadn't called me yet, but I'm, I good. smell one coming. <laughs> That's good. I haven't spoken to her recently, but... You, but, might, you might want to... to well, I did show her the concept plan, and, and she's, she likes it. Well, let me just emphasize that this is not just for Tool Hill. This is a facility that will be used throughout the community. So I don't want us to get uh, so wrapped up in one area that this we only need input from just that one area. Uh, even though there is a neighborhood association with input, there are others that are having input as well. So well, both uh, of these uh, groups have uh, con conversed with me, and uh, they're talking like 12 months agreements to use them certain hours of the afternoon and day for both of them, which pretty well ties up the event. So mm -hmm. we, well, I think we just need to be careful that if you will, the neighborhoods can use it also. Right. I think when, the, when they say that, when Council on Aging says that and Boys and Girls Clubs say that, they're talking about events that folks can register <coughs> to participate in. It's not just Council on Aging exclusive It's open to the public right. still. They'll just be coordinating those so we don't have to provide a staff person. We need to be sure that we include everybody around. Correct. And, uh, okay. Yes, sir. Which brings up an interesting point. Are you going to have control access like you do at Odell? Swipe a card to get in, yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, to the bike paths, uh, State DOT has the TAP application at this point. Uh, Gerald Jefferson from the county today told me that approval should be just a few weeks. The engineering part, North Augusta did one of these last year. The engineering part for them took several months. So again, we'll keep you updated on that as that goes forward. And, and essentially, the a TAP grant, the Transportation Alternative Program, when you apply for these, it guarantees the SCDOT is going to do all the engineering. 
So they'll have to go ahead and look at the Richland Avenues, looking at Hain Avenue, looking at Park, and they'll have to come back to and what we vote on at the last meeting, or I don't know we even voted, but the Planning Commission will go ahead and review uh, any plans that SCDOT has, make any recommendations. Um, if we see no problems, then we'll move forward. If we see a problem, then it'll be coming back to City Council. But so the first thing, for instance, on Hain, is there enough right of way, paved right of way, where you could get uh, a separated bike path, or is it going to have to be shared the lane? Or you're going to have to go ahead and tear up some of the median. Uh, but that all is going to have to come back to the Planning Commission once the SCDOT looks at it. Hain's already been taken care of. You mean, you mean Hampton? I'm sorry, yeah. Hampton. <laughs> We don't want to go to Hain again. <laughs> Let's bring Hain back up. Let's do Hain. Let's do Hain again. again. <laughs> while we're talking, for John's sake, he needs to go through that. <laughs> while we're talking about Hain, uh, Roger, did you have a chance to check with DOT today or either one? Um, Stewart, we haven't heard anything yet. Uh, we talked to George this morning. We're hoping that we hear back from them. I mean, we thought we'd hear, heard already. For those council members that don't know. We made an application to the highway department to take the chevrons and to move those outside the parking lane. Uh, that was about eight weeks ago. We haven't heard back from the highway department getting official approval. So what we did about the third week in September, in September, so third week in March, uh, when the various equestrian events were going on, we knew they were going to get visitors. Easter was coming up. Uh, so we took it on our own to blacken out so people could park there. Sure. Uh, they may come back to us and say, uh, we don't approve what you all voted on. And then we'll have to go ahead and decide what's the next step that we'd have. But right now it's to go ahead and leaving the area from the white line on in for parking and having uh, the bike lane outside the parking. Shared lane markings. Right. Yeah, okay. Now, but we're waiting on the permit from them. Yeah, if you recall, what was voted on uh, did have an exception from SCDOT. They had a concern about leaving the white lines. And that they was did. On item two. And, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's taking as long as it is. Because the local people can't just approve that it's going up the ladder. Thank okay. you. Okay, on Northside Recreation, in your packet, you have a rendering of what the restrooms at Perry Park could look like. Uh, Josh Stewart is very, very close to giving us final construction documents on those. Don't see the rendering. You had it here. Page 106. Report. Page what? 106. Oh. Thank you. Oh, there it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's hard to see. I apologize. It's, <laughs> it's a bathroom with concession area at yeah. the one end, but we can't call it concession area because the state will allow that. Oh. Bathrooms with a little area for people to kind of go in and rest. Educational space. There'll be restrooms. There'll be uh, the restrooms <laughs> will be like we've done at most of our facilities now. They'll be on a timer. They'll click on early in the morning. At midnight, they'll shut off so folks can't go in after midnight. But if they're in, they can get out. Um, the the meeting room, as you say, will have shelves in it. It'll have sinks and water and those kind of things. We put a, I think it's a three and a half foot roll up window in the front so you could serve out of that window if you wanted to. So I'm pretty comfortable with it. We'll match the look of the Schofield Middle School. So it'll, it'll look a little different than some of the things we built, but it'll match the look of the school. The bad news is once we get all this done, it goes to the state. It's an eight to 12 week approval process from the state. I know. Once the, once the state approves it, then it comes back to us, and at that point, we can get it out to bid. I spoke with Representative Clyburn, so you may want to talk with him, um, and it may not take that long Good. at all. Good. The Thank hammer, you. Clyburn. But, you know, th th you. This, yes. this place is utilized in the summer and early fall, and there are events coming up, and these bathrooms won't even be constructed well. by then. I do have, uh, prior to taking it to the uh, school district, Stewart Builders is currently, and I was hoping to have that tonight, and I, they didn't get it to me, but we're doing a cost analysis. So we, we will have a good handle on what it's going to cost us 
do we need to trim it back or, or whatever before we take it out to bid. Okay, switching over, rolling over to fund 017. Uh, again, you've got the comments about Eustace Park. One thing I, I guess I could say about Eustace Park, if you ride by tomorrow and you, you're not comfortable with where the building's going to go, we as the city could go back to the school board and make an, an official presentation to them if we so chose to ask them to look at this again. I think probably what they'd like to see is a site plan and then they'd also like to see probably in writing because most of our conversations with with mr caver have just been talking with him but they'd probably like to see in writing what the silly city would be willing to offer them well, well I, I, Glenn, let me just say that i am not so sure if uh, many folks know on the school board um, what we are requesting and i'd like a formal presentation okay. but don't want that held up uh, because this if we continue to hold things up it will be three or four years down the road and still no senior youth center so continue with the plans but make a formal presentation to the school board and i agree with that i'm just wondering and i'm sensitive to what you're saying about the scheduling is this worthwhile for us to have sort of a work session on it a very brief one maybe but a work session on it before a formal presentation is made so each of us as we might converse with school board members or something yeah. we we're better prepared in, in those conversations also. I'm not sure, I haven't, didn't look at their calendar, I'm not sure when we could get into their rotation. Tad's here, he, may, he probably knows when their meetings are. <laughs> Tad, am, am, am I Let's hope so. <laughs> accurate in terms of saying that many board members may not be aware of what we're requesting? And it was a very split vote. It was one vote from being approved last time. Uh, the thing we want to be sure is we don't slow this down. Exactly. Glenn and I started on this almost four years ago, so this time we need to not have another false start. And the design of this building may change slightly <laughs> if it's moved 100 feet east to west. So essentially, there's whether we meet the school board or not it should not slow the architect down whatsoever in their design process yeah, they can keep moving but they can keep moving on that time schedule while council members and staff meet with the school board footprint of the building wouldn't change no at no. all detention location lo the location storm drains those kind of things would change if we right. moved over okay uh, glenn if you will allow me to ask a question regarding <clears throat> your uh, this sheet that you have provided us with, mm -hmm. uh, item eight with Eustace Park with project budget of a million dollars and the, the, the project balance versus this sheet with Eustace Park, you show um, three point five. Yeah, one is in capital project sales tax three the other one's in capital project sales tax two so if you add them both together you got close okay. to four and a half million all right i wasn't right. sure where you would show if you were showing this on this sheet so so you got the nine hundred thousand here right and then you got um just to see what you said okay, okay. Two. i missed that okay glasses thank you, you want to i need them mm -hmm. Okay, moving along, uh, Citizens Park fence work is primarily completed. That looks very good. You, you allowed them, I think, at the last meeting or the meeting before you approved them to, to use the balance to do some other work. They're doing that now. Uh, Northside neighborhood renewal, later in your agenda, you're going to see the short term initiatives for that. Uh, the walking trail expansion of the municipal building uh, if you haven't walked in the offices downtown downstairs you should take a chance take an opportunity to do that i think all the carpeting's in most of the painting has been done there's just a little bit of touch up that's got to be done here and there and then once the decisions are made on, on who's going where people can move back into those those offices regarding the uh, fire station headquarters Moore and Associates has been hired to do an assessment of the training tower and the burn building. The assessment of the training tower will be structural and it will be looking at repelling, how they hook in when they do the repelling, and they'll be looking at OSHA requirements, make sure those are up to date, 
and then on the burn building they're going to be de determining the extent of the damage as it, as, it, as it exists today to see what we need to do in the future. And I think that's it because the rest of it is, is we don't look to have funding for the rest of the projects. Any questions? Okay. Very good. Thank you, Glad later on. Okay, item three. First reading of an ordinance <coughs> to rezone property at West Side Town Creek Road at Seven Oaks Drive. March 6th to office institutional. We'll yes, sir. I'm going to read this by its title. It's an ordinance amending the zoning of real estate owned by Finley Brothers LLC from residential single family RS6 to office institutional. Uh, this went before the Planning Commission at the last meeting. It's essentially at the corner of Silver Bluff and Town Creek Road, right across from our water treatment plant. It's been vacated for many years. Uh, Mike Calhoun, who is here tonight, uh, uh, is looking at trying to do an office building there. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on this at the last meeting. Uh, Planning Commission did vote to deny it, uh, and he is here tonight to go ahead and speak to council concerning this. So for council consideration, this is first reading of an ordinance to rezone two lots on Town Creek Road across from the street of Seven Oaks Drive from residential RS6 to office institutional. Okay, very good. All right, that's Mike. Mike. Where is he? He's coming up. Coming okay. on the there way. he is. Okay. Good evening. Good. Um, my name is Mike Thompson. I reside at 225 Magnolia Lake Road here in uh, here Naked. Um, my request tonight, actually I wanted to correct one of the things that Roger said. I actually purchased the property. It's six acres. Um, I subsequently uh, subdivided it into three parcels because I wanted to meet the spirit of the law with regard to the comprehensive plan. And so, and I believe that if you'll you know, take the time to, to look at sort of what I've done, you'll see that I have met the spirit of the law. And I believe that I've talked to the owners, I mean, uh, the residences, and you know, that all the adjacent property owners, those on Whipper Will, you know, the property owner that's in the county. Um, I've not found anybody in disagreement. In fact, there's been an agreement with everyone that I've talked to, because it, it, I believe that you'll find that it, it benefits all the stakeholders involved, especially those that are adjacent to the property. So what I'd like to do, can we put up on the board the- um, Is it 116? Is it that picture there that you're looking at? Well, actually, the first one. <coughs> Page 115. Yeah. 115, Sarah. Not the one. It's, it's one page 115 as it's labeled, but it would be probably about 100 there. The reason why you're too far. Is item three. <clears throat> Agenda item three, sir. It's Page 115, label at the bottom right of the page. Page 115. Yep, keep going. Yeah, continue. Keep scrolling that way. You're in the right department. Next. Next. There, 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 there you go. Okay. The reason I wanted to bring this up is because at the planning commission, you know, it was denied based on I didn't meet the criteria of being within the comprehensive plan. 
if you look at everything to the north, which would be everything in blue, that's all office. That's part of the center south office park. The white property, now the property I purchased is the red property. That's all R6. The property to the east, to the right, white, that's uh, in the county, that's urban development, and that's presently a uh, hair salon and spa. Um, There's a laser pointer there for it. Yeah, yeah, but see that white remote control looking thing between the computer and the and the display. Oh, this thing. Yeah, that's a laser pointer, I believe. Oh wow. You, I, what do I push? Probably that red button, I would guess. Mm. Roger, isn't that a it's not. laser? Do you need a laser? I don't really. That's a I mean. If you, if you, now, if you look at the below picture, you'll see the subdivision that I did. The 1.8, the 1.86 acres that I'm requesting be rezoned is that property directly across the street from the office zoning. And that is in what color? Well, it's, see, it's not shown on the red. It's okay. shown, it's, it's, it, it's the, it, it's, is it laser pointer? Is it the white, Mike? Okay, there we go. That's okay. Okay, that's better. That property there is, that's 1.86 acres. There's 380 feet on Town Creek Road right there, and it goes back 200 feet. So that's the 1.86 acres we're talking about. Parcel one, which is this irregular shape property, I did that intentionally because that remains R6. And so what you have is you have, it died. Anyways. Um, So you have a buffer. So yeah, so, so I guess the main thing would, is to look at what surrounds the property. I have office to the north. I have urban development to the east. I've got the existing R6 buffer that what you have right now. And I also, to the west, I have a buffer, which is the, the if, if you go, if you move it up, yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got a laser for you. <clears throat> it just work. Uh oh. It's not like it okay. Everything on that side of the road is office. That property is urban development. This property is continues in red, and the property to the west is in red. So I this this line that's 700 feet so i've maintained the spirit of the comprehensive plan which it goes from you know if you look at the office all i'm asking is that office come across the street we maintain the buffer of r6 to both the south and the west the things that you should be aware of on this property the property for the last 30 years has been agriculture has had an agricultural exemption. No, it's a tree farm. No, so you're getting really no taxes on it at all. The other thing you should know is I, I have a letter of intent from a local business that wants to double their size and have a new home. Um, they want to put a 6,500 square foot building there. So it not only, you know, and that's really doubling their size. So it not only increases the tax base, it increases the economic activity in building a 6,500 square foot building and it's going to add jobs. I've maintained the buffer of R6, which is consistent with what the plan is right now. And that's really my, you know, my pace right there. I just, I have somebody ready, willing, and able that wants to put an office building there. It creates, I believe, to be the highest and best use for the property. Um, my alternative, you know, should you, should you not, you know, choose to approve this, then there's really two things that will happen. One is the status quo. 
you know, it'll stay an agriculturally, you know, uh, exempt property as a tree farm. It won't really collect much in taxes, or I'll be successful in selling it to a developer. And a developer, this is R6, so it's 60 foot lots. And when I talk to the residents in uh, Whipperwill, especially those right adjacent, their concern is the developer's going to come in because they know that, that property drops 22 feet from the top northeast corner to the back southwest corner. So to balance that site, you're going to take every tree down, and they're just concerned about having a bunch of little homes, a lot smaller than their homes, you know, right behind them. So I'm meeting the there, you know, if you approve this, you know, they have a sense of relief because I've minimized the risk of that happening because that irregular shaped piece of property, you're not going to get much development on that piece of property. You, you might split it into two lots or something like that, but they would be acre lots. That's, you know, that's two, that's two and a half acres, that piece of property. So that's, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Mike, uh, I'm reading this. Uh, it says it's not consistent with the comprehensive plan and the proposed zoning. Uh, what inconsistent? Uh, do you well, deny? Well, everything, you know, everything that is south of Town Creek yeah. is in a district that they say should not have any commercial development. But, but you're looking at a, you know, from three to 700 foot depth parcel. And, you know, I've already uh, sign an agreement with DOT to take their parcel up to 380 feet. As part of that agreement, they've, they've agreed to put the curb cut because when I last was here, we changed the entrance way to parcel number one, which is the entrance way. And so the DOT has agreed to put the curb cut and to bring the road 15 feet in. Okay, I, I guess one question here. Planning Commission is saying it's not comp it's not uh, does not meet the comprehensive plan. Is that true? Or, well, or, you have to ask the planning I mean, department. That's what they well, said. That, that's what yeah, they that's said. What, it, I, I mean, this is very important. Is that oh, no, is that accurate, or or how do you get around that? Well, technically, I, I guess you could say that. Well, they did. But but also, you're supposed to. The city is mandated to update that comprehensive plan every 10 years. That's right. Which you failed, which it hasn't been updated. And usually you're updating and modifying that when you have widening of roads, where you have trends and growth patterns that change. I would argue that this road's getting a lot busier. That's why they're doing all this widening of roads here. All I'm trying to do is do what's in the best interest of all those neighbors. And what's in the best interest of those neighbors is to keep as many trees as we can keep. And if I put a office building up there, it's going to be your, your best sound barrier. I'm going to be able to maintain trees. The people in Whipperwill are going to maintain property values. It's a win-win for every stakeholder there. Except that the planning department says it doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> but I, but I've still met the spirit of you no. Know, the plan, it doesn't account for, it, it's taking one piece of property. I mean, we've got a busy road there. There's a water treatment plan and a hair salon. What home is going to, you know, who would build a new home right there? Can we get the interim planning director to tell us why he said it was inconsistent? Yeah. yeah. If council uh, decides to rezone this property because the comprehensive plan, again, which is now 10 years old, it's in the budget to redo it, you would just need to say, uh, we're going to go change this plan. Uh, and the reason we're revising this in relationship with the current comprehensive plan because of these reasons, mm -hmm. change in traffic patterns, mm -hmm. what's happening in that area. Tommy? Uh, the reason that we say it's not consistent <clears throat> with the uh, comprehensive plan is in the comprehensive plan you've got the narrative but you also have the diagrams that shows the parcels that shows the acreage in this particular area shaded in shows single family residential so that's what the plan calls for there is the is it appropriate to put you know 
uh, office there instead? I don't know. That you know, that's y'all's call. Um, that, with the shifting patterns and that kind of thing, but the plan shows it as residential, single family. Well, it seems to me, given the, the buffer that Mr. Calhoun is willing to put in, given the uh, approval, as he's indicated from the neighbors, and given that we're not talking about a high volume business that's going to have a lot of traffic, I think he mentioned that in the planning commission that I was at that it was going to be a, a medical office. It, it's actually children's physical therapy office. Physical therapy office, so it's not going to be a high traffic um, business. Um, I, I, I guess I'm confused with what you said, Roger. Do we do we have to have something in the motion, pretty much like the planning commission? It'd be does? best if you could go ahead and if you decide that you want to approve this tonight. Uh, we're approving it, and we're revising the comprehensive plan to allow office in this area, due to the fact that it it is transitioning Silver Bluff Road, getting more traffic. It's going to be widened. Um, there is a dental office right across the street. We have a water plant across the street. Mm -hmm. So that when the comprehensive plan is revised later this year, that process starts, you're indicating to the planning commission and to the new planner director that we have, this is the change that we'd like to see on this particular road. Okay, so. Otherwise, you're voting against the comprehensive plan that council approved 10 years ago. So the motion would be I move to change a comprehensive plan to permit this project? Yes. And based on change in traffic patterns. Based on change in traffic patterns? Right. You're doing good. Anybody yeah. else want to help out? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's my motion. motion. That's good. Okay. I second. I'll in, second. In, okay, we have a second. Okay. In the motion. Yes, did. She second. If, if I made the motion. She's I second. second. If, if I made the motion is also to accept the rezoning of the property as requested by the applicant. Yes, I'm sorry. Both. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Actually the the second, the first thing you made the motion is what we're alter adding to the motion. Okay. Call for ready to Does vote. everybody understand? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> Show of hands please, all in favor. Pass this unanimous. Mr. Mayor, if I may before you move on. Yeah. Um, there were no thank you, Mike. There were no conditions um, set aside for that particular rezoning request. And I'm, I'm hearing Mr. Calhoun say he's willing to leave a buffer in place. I'm not sure whether Office Institutional would require that buffer to be in place. But I think he wants to do that because that's the discussion and, and he's had with his. What, I, what, I'm, yeah. what, I'm, what I'm thinking is before we go to second reading, if maybe Mr. Calhoun could get with Mr. Paradise. And come up with a list of appropriate conditions. If, if that would be would retain its RC zoning. It's not real right. I mean, because the irregular shape of that is right. going to restrict. It's not you're not going to see a subdivision there. You might see a house there or two houses there at the most. You know, it'll remain R6 with the limitations right. Yeah, exactly. Right. So but the shape of it is what Mike, if you could do this with, with Tommy. I will. If you could before we have second reading, if we could list that one or two or three items that with this change, we will keep X buffer or sure. so that it's laid out here. Otherwise, uh, I think you, your intent is to do that, but it's not stated here. Okay. So, Tommy, if you could then go ahead and give us those few points and then we could include it before second reading. One of the things that our attorney was saying is that you, it's not mandatory that you do this, but I think that's been the discussion okay. you've had with some of the neighbors. And um, Like for, at the planning commission, mm -hmm. Mrs. Green was there, and she was the one most affected. Mm -hmm. So, right. so when, before I changed this, you know, after talking to her, Correct. is I said I changed the shape of it so that I created this this triangle piece that is undevelopable. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can't really build anything on it. So nobody's going to take the expense of taking trees down because it's it's sort of created. But if we could have that here in before second reading, that would be I'll good for Thank everybody. You. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Number four, first reading of an ordinance to annex. 27.27 acres on Old Aiken Airport Road and zone at PR Plan Residential. Mr. LeDuc. Yes, I'm going to read this ordinance by its title. It's an ordinance to annex the corporate limits of the city of Aiken. Certain property consists of 27.27 acres of land more or less owned by Gall and Caldwell, LLC, and to zone the same Plan Residential PR. 
there's a number of conditions. The Planning Commission did approve this. Uh, they said if you are to approve this and the annexation with the zoning, that they would have the following conditions. One, the development comply with the concept plan submitted and there be a note added to the plan that the project comply with the provisions of the plan residential zone at 4.26, that either the plan should be revised to show a paved stub out to the western property line at a location approved by the planning director to allow future interconnectivity with parcel B, or a waiver should be granted from the provision of the access management ordinance which requires a stub out. Three, that a 10 foot deep buffer be installed between the existing seven single family residents on the eastern side of Old Airport Road, west of the project that are contiguous to the townhomes as required by section 467E. That a 10 foot buffer between the townhomes and the apartment be installed as required by 467E. Uh, and then these last couple are, are pretty much common in all of our annexations with development. This property is literally right across from the corner of Citizens Park uh, where the third complex is at. So these individuals will be able to enjoy the amenities that we have there, but included within this project is a swimming pool, uh, a clubhouse, and some other things for the apartment complex and the townhomes. Uh, Planning Commission did approve this, so this is first reading of an ordinance to annex 27.27 acres on Old Airport Road and is zoned as PR planned residential. Okay, thank you, sir. Do we have a motion and a second for approval? Mr. Mayor, I'd move approval of the motion um, and with regard to item number two uh, of the conditions, I, my motion would include that, either the, that the plan should be revised to show a paved stub out of the western property line at a location approved by the planning director to allow future interconnectivity with parcel B. Second, sir. Okay. All right. Any other any discussion? I think so. Yep. We have someone who wants to speak to it. Good. Mr. Duar, uh, if I, uh, if I can clarify, you're you're asking on, on number two, you're asking to at, at the end of parcel B delete the rest of the sentence. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, my name is Philip Green. I'm with Southern Partners, 1233 Augusta West Parkway. Um, I'm here on behalf of my clients. Um, just wanted to go through some of these conditions. I'll try to be brief. I know it's getting late. A um, couple of points of, um, of clarification uh, in reading through some of the, um, the staff reports and the, uh, the items that came up from the Planning Commission. I um, want to clarify that the, uh, on the single family residential portion, the uh, seven and a half foot side setbacks um, would be a minimum seven and a half foot side setback. Obviously, if the uh, uh, residences were two story, that would have to be increased uh, to provide for the 20 foot separation as required by code. Um, the other point of clarification is on the town home unit size uh, being listed at 26 by 42. Um, that does not include the uh, a 12 foot attached garage that would be on each town home unit. Uh, just wanted to, to provide those items for a clarification for the record. Wait, where is the seven and a half foot um, buffer? It, it's, it's, on the, um, it's on the concept plan. Um, okay, it, so it talks it about a seven and a half foot okay. side setback on the on the residential. So it doesn't units. need to be a condition. Then. Um, no. I don't. I don't feel it needs to be a condition. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, um, thank you. Since the approved concept plan was part of the uh, was part of the conditions. The um, item number two, um, I would ask that we potentially move that um, until such time as that adjacent parcel would be developed. Uh, right now, we don't have a layout. We don't have a concept of what might happen on that adjacent parcel. Um, so in order to provide a stub out, I think would be a little premature, not knowing, again, the, the layout or traffic circulation of that adjacent parcel. Could you select wording that would be acceptable to you for our next uh, meeting? Sir? Could you select wording of paragraph two that would be acceptable? Yes, sir. Uh, Absolutely. Before our next meeting? Yes, sir. I'd be glad to do that. Um, and then three and four taken together uh, with regards to the 10-foot deep buffers. Um, 
with the configuration of the existing single family residences on Old Airport Road, um, with the idea that these townhomes will be developed with fully fenced backyards, um, privacy fenced, um, looking at the topography of the parcels as they relate to each other, um, I don't believe that um, it will be necessary to put in a 10 foot buffer between us and the, uh, and the contiguous single family residences. Um, between us and the uh, proposed apartments, um, I feel like we will provide uh, substantial landscaping between those two entities. Obviously, it's in my client's best interest to provide that separation uh, if he wants to, to be able to market these properties. Uh, again, the townhomes would, would have the privacy fence uh, enclosing the backyard. And I just don't feel that it's, it's entirely necessary to have the 10 foot deep buffer. I would ask the council uh, to perhaps give us a waiver on those two uh, buffers. I'd be glad to answer any questions or try to answer any questions. Uh, obviously, my motion included the 10 foot buffer. I'd like to get the view of other members of council how they feel. I guess did the the Planning Commission voted on this and passed it as we received it, correct? Correct. Yes. Sir. And you're asking for a change to that. Well, the um, and I believe the uh, the buffers are 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 not required, other than to say that um, I believe it's up to the planning director. Um, to look at those and yes, but I mean ultimately I'm asking to to change that recommendation. You're talking about the buffer between the townhouses and the apartments? And the yes. Or between Buff the buffers within the this is within item, a PR zone. Item three all and four. Them. All, of them. all of them. Okay. Well yeah, I just item you three know, again if, and if the council feels as though it, it there should they should be there um, adjacent to the single family residential, but perhaps not uh, between the townhomes and the apartments. Um, what are the reasons that you don't feel that it's necessary? You said you don't think it's necessary to have the buffer. Uh, again, due to the, the configuration of the of the existing structures on the existing single family residential, um, they're they're very deep lots. Um, the the structures don't really come toward the rear property line. I don't think there's um, there's really going to be any any visual uh, issues there. Uh, again, we will be entirely fencing in the backyard with the privacy fence. Uh, on the townhome units, uh, which I believe will provide protection and privacy on, on both sides of that fence. Excuse me, I think maybe Tommy wants yeah, to tell us something. Yeah, I was going to ask Tommy needs to comment on this to be <coughs> sure tell us that what your thoughts we're, are. we're going down the right path. And the issue is if they're fencing in the backyards, why another buffer? Well, <coughs> if this was um, a du these townhomes are duplexes. Okay. Uh, if this was single family attached, there are duplexes between detached uh, single families, which is the scenario here. Mm -hmm. If this wasn't zone plan residential and it was just a development coming in, the landscaping regulations would require the 10 foot buffer between the duplexes and the single family homes. Likewise, between the apartments and the duplexes, if it wasn't coming before y'all, the zoning ordinance would require that as well for that 10 foot undisturbed buffer. I don't know how you feel about undisturbed buffers. <laughs> yeah, I was about to go there. <laughs> but, but those buffers would re be required typically anyway. This would be a waiver saying that it's not required. And the fence offers some privacy, but it still doesn't buffer the sound as much as the visual, the vegetation, and the, um, the screening there. So are you suggesting both the fence and the, the, um, the, 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 or, ordinance, call, the ordinance calls for the 10 foot buffer. Now, the fence is in addition to that, or you know, if you wanted to put the fence in lieu of that, and if we did that, you know, we... Well, the fence is their deal. I mean, that's not correct. part of the ordinance. That's, they choose to do it or not do it. That's their deal. Correct. And normally, uh, you know, a lot of times there's a buffer around the plan unit development anyway. 
And this one doesn't really have a buffer around the entire development, setting it off from everybody else. But the reason that it's in the staff report is those two issues is that if it wasn't PR and with some other zoning district where these were allowed, both of those would be required to be 10 foot buffers. The undisturbed Keep buffer, is, it, is that area, of, in the areas that we're talking about, particularly between the single family, existing single family uh, detached residences that are there now and the new proposed townhomes, that's pretty wooded right now, isn't it, or is it fairly clear? I think it's pretty wooded. So un I, I untouched been. buffer means it would remain wooded, only 10 feet, but it would remain wooded. And remain wooded, yes. Okay. And, and you can go in there for good forestry management, to clean out dead wood, that, that type of thing. Yes, sir, it's supposed to remain pretty much undisturbed like it is. Okay. I guess where I sit is, although we have ordinances in place, and we are to adhere to those ordinances, we, it, there comes a point of common sense as, as well. What makes sense? And he doesn't have to put a fence in, he's putting a fence in. Our ordinance says to have a buffer. So do we want one or the other or both? Right now we're saying we under the fence, but we're asking to do the buffer as well. I think if I were moving in there, I'd, I'd take the buffer over the fence. Right. And if a fence was important, I'd build it if the developer didn't. But uh, I, you know, making him put a buffer between his own apartments and his own townhouses, especially if it's going to be this undisturbed thing where you're going to have 10 feet of, of scrubby pine trees, that little, that's going to be a little strip. If you look at the site plan, it's going to be a little strip of the undisturbed area that would, I think, frankly, kind of look funny. And it's his own development, so he's going to do, as Mr. Green referred to, he's going to do something landscaping-wise that might be better than an undisturbed buffer to be more aesthetically appealing and, and, and a separation. But I wouldn't enforce the buffer between his apartments and his townhomes. That's, that's all within the confines of his <laughs> development, and that should be up to him as to what he thinks he can sell or rent or what have you. Um, particularly with the undisturbed thing, I, you know, I've got a hang up, maybe I'm, maybe I'm too hung up on it, but this undisturbed buffer is an imperfect buffer at best. Um, and so, you know, you may have one pine tree in there every 75 feet, and that's hardly a buffer at all, whereas Mr. Green has suggested that, that they might put in a, a little more uh, consistent planning scheme there, but that would be up to them and within the confines of their own space. I would certainly ask, uh, particularly between the townhomes and apartments, if we do a buffer, that it not be undisturbed again. Yeah. With, uh, it looks sloppy. With, if with grading undisturbed. restrictions and, and mm -hmm. anything else uh, that might go along with that development, that would be uh, that'd be very difficult. Let me ask a question. Is this something that should go back to planning for their review of these different things we're talking about now? Well, they passed it to us without yeah. this exception, but they passed it on mm -hmm. to us. And the motion does not include the word undisturbed. The motion just it says buffer. That. Hmm? Yeah, it does not include undisturbed. That word's not in there. I mean, that's, that's always the implication, but I don't know if it has to be in there or not. I, I prefer, I don't like undisturbed buffers, but. Yes, but what we're saying is yeah. that it's, not, well, I, it's not in the write-up that we right. have. So. I know what you're saying, and I don't know if, if it's implied or not. It'd be up to the city attorney maybe to say that, but I'd, I'd rather it not be in there as well I mean it isn't with the motion right and that's what you're requesting right not to have a undisturbed buffer he's requesting no buffer it, it, the good. original request would be in lieu of the buffer to, to have the six-foot privacy fence which will be enclosing in the backyards and townhomes well it bothers me that we get something uh, I guess and then we sit here and talk about changing it and make and make any changes i think it ought to go back to the way i understand go back to plan this is a, well was this was this discussed uh, was the fence discussed at planning commission as well um, i guess if it was discussed there and put in here then it's okay uh, that's what the confusion is what was discussed at planning 
versus what we're discussing now because if they if they approved it already you know that's that would be fine with me well it's sound it, if they approve buffers and we're saying this gentleman is saying no buffers is that what you're saying <laughs> well I'm Mike, I'm Mike Caldwell um, I, what occurred at the planning meeting as per my memory, you will understand where that goes sometimes, <laughs> was basically um, these items were not specifically discussed in this kind of detail. Basically, we talked a little bit about the project and then there was a motion to approve, seconded and voted and it was over. So it really wasn't discussed in, in this format at all. We didn't discuss the buffers um, uh, as part of the conditions. That, the way the initial motion was made, um, it was seconded. There was a question about, I think there was a question raised at the meeting about the, the setbacks or something. And there was a motion started and it was amended by someone to pass it and approve it just with the conditions as they're listed, Mr. Evans. What, what we have in front of us now. Yes, sir. What they're yeah. essentially asking for is, I mean, if you imagine a neighborhood you know, one person's property butts up to the other person's property with a common property line and so somebody might put a fence on one side and they're not and you know in a regular neighborhood you're not required to keep your fence 10 feet away from the property line so these folks are asking to be able to put that fence for these townhomes essentially right on the property line between them the shared property line between them and these single family residences so it would be a it would be visually to, to somebody standing there it'd be very similar to what you'd see in, in any other neighborhood um, however, what our plan residential requirements normally specify is that you indeed have 10 feet separation from, from any activity to be undisturbed 10 feet separation, which would basically mean that we'd be keeping those fences 10 feet away from that property line. So, I mean, the, the ramification of making this exception is that there's a fence right there at the property line, which you see in every neighborhood all over the downtown, south side, any, north side, anywhere you go, um, you know, that's really the ramification of this. What's unusual about it is it would be an exception to the normal buffer requirements that we'd have in a planned residential zone. Page 234 of our packet is the minutes from the Planning Commission, and uh, if you look at that, the third paragraph, Commissioner DeBrule asked about the buffer, so um, guess what the buffers would be between this development and the existing homeowners. And what will happen to the old growth threes? Mr. Codwall replied that the back porches of the townhomes would be enclosed with fences and possibly an additional 10 foot planted buffer beyond that, but he is not sure yet if that'll be necessary. He noted they would like to save as much of the old growth trees as possible, especially in the buffers and open space areas, but he was not sure if the ones directly around the townhomes could be kept. He pointed out the recent redesign that added the 20 foot common area down the center of the townhomes to serve as a viewscape and entire and entice people driving by and entering. So, I, I mean, the buffers were discussed at least in part there, and the motion still came up with a uh, with a 10-foot buffers. Again, Miss Paradise may be able to help us. But, but Mike, am I clear on this? You're asking for no buffers. Well, we're, we're asking for the fence to be in lieu of. The ten foot buffer oh, okay. separation, which, which is different than what we were seeing, and, and I guess just Here. to to kind of clear this so we can can all move on. If if council decided that you didn't want to give us the exception with the ten foot buffer between the single family residences, obviously we'd like to keep moving forward with the development. We're on a timetable to do so. The thing that we'd like to do is have you consider what we discussed about the apartment buffer being being something that we could do with landscaping versus trying to create uh, undisturbed input spacing um, so we could keep the project moving ahead. Can this be taken care of between the two readings? Uh, was, I guess the city, I see the city attorney shaking yeah, his head. That, yes, uh, sure. Can, uh, can, yes. can it, uh, Tommy, be taken care of between the two readings? I believe so. This was the first I heard about the fault issue and not this night. So I think he said that we're talking about something. And, and it's his request for going to a landscape buffer between the apartments and the townhomes is a very reasonable. And in fact, I think we'd all like the outcome much better 
than uh, than leaving that undisturbed. Mm -hmm. But but the question is, do we need to pass this on first reading Correct. and then those changes be yeah, made yeah, yeah, to yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. We don't yeah. want to make those changes here. I think that should be between yeah, staff and, right. and the developers. As, as Mike said, they're on a time right. scale. Right. But, right. You know, it went to the Planning Commission one way, and we should not get into the habit of allowing the projects to come to us with big changes, although the last item yeah. um, we need to came to us the way it came from the Planning Commission. It was. Uh, Rejected, and we decided to make the exception. I think we need to we need to pass it like it is, and then these changes be made before second reading. And I see the city attorney shaking his head. Call out a motion. Okay. <laughs> Do we already have a yes, motion? Motion yes, 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 okay. okay. right. 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 okay. Show of hands, please. Passes unanimously. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Item five, first reading of an ordinance to annex four lots on Mississippi Avenue owned by Habitat for Humanity and zone the area RS10 residential single. That way. Yes, sir. This is an ordinance to annex the corporate limits of the city of Aiken, property consisting of 1.76 acres of land more or less owned by Aiken County Habitat for Humanity and to zone the same residential single family RS10. Uh, this again was approved unanimously by the Planning Commission at their last meeting. They would like to come into the city so they get the city services. Sewer is at a distance that uh, our engineering department has reviewed that and is recommending uh, that they would be able to get a waiver from having to extend the sanitary sewer. So for City Council consideration, this is first reading of an ordinance to annex four lots on Mississippi Avenue to the city and to zone it RS-10. Okay, thank you, so moved, Mr. Mayor. Second, Mr. Mayor. And Richard okay. Church has been very patient. Any discussion? If not, show hands, please. Pass this you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you'd like to come and say something. <laughs> don't, don't leave yet. Good night. <laughs> thank you for coming and listening. A lot more fun. <laughs> Okay, okay. Item six, approval of a bid award for installation of a section of <coughs> the Lawrence Street <coughs> SW water line. We have a two inch water line uh, on Lawrence Street right now. Uh, it's very old and we have been searching for a solution uh, to service some of the problem areas, uh, especially when the Haslips were putting in the new apartments. They had to extend this and just lots of problems. Also, there is a dry cleaners right behind our current building uh, that has suffered from red water on several occasions when we've been turning water on and off. And we think this will go ahead and help solve some of those problems. So for city council consideration, we are asking you to approve the low bid award uh, for running a water line down Lawrence Street for $88,118. The funds will come from CPST3. Okay, very good. Do we have a motion and a second? Move for approval, Mr. Mayor, to Babcock. Second. second. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Show of hands, please. All in favor. Passes unanimously. You know, Seems like a good price for that work. Mm -hmm. Item Especially seven. On Lawrence. Yeah. Item seven, first reading of an ordinance to amend the F FY 2014-15 budget for emergency work to reallocate a water main. In the budget ordinance, any project that is not already listed and it's going to be over $25,000, it should come before City Council for approval. This is one of those cases. We're on 19 uh, by, I think it's Good Springs Road. They're widening it for a left-hand turn lane, and when they're doing the grading in the ditched area on the east side of the road, uh, they ran into our water line. It needs to be lowered uh, by a couple different, several feet. And so the bid to go ahead and lower the water line uh, was $105,000. Uh, again, the money would come uh, from, in this case, our water and sewer fund uh, for this work. Of course, your consideration, this is first reading of ordinance to amend the fiscal year budget to allow expenditures from the water and sewer fund for emergency work to relocate a water line at the intersection of SC19 and Good Springs Road. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion and a second for approval? I so move. Second. second. Okay, any discussion? If not, show of hands, please. All in favor, pass this unanimous. Item 8, approval of a bid award to spend capital projects sales tax funds for street resurfacing. Mr. Leduc, please. Yes, we did not um, 
we still have some money left over from CPST 2, and then we have not spent any money from CPST 3 uh, for resurfacing of city streets. Uh, we received a bid from Satterfield for 546681 uh, If you approve this tonight, this work would be done sometime summer to early fall uh, for the work that we have in mind. So for your consideration tonight, this approval bid award for street resurfacing using CPST 2 and CPST 3 money. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion and a second for approval? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. Okay. Discussion? If not, show of hands, please. Pass this unanimously. Item 9, resolution to accept property located at 414 Fairfield Street, Northeast, from Macon County Forfeited Land Commission. This picture property is inside the city. It's at 414 Fairfield Avenue. It needs to come down. It's been a uh, property that's been abandoned for some time. The Aiken County, uh, it came up in their list. No one wanted to buy it. They're willing to go us, give us the property. We have the money in CBG, CDBG money to tear it down. And so the first step, though, would be for City Council to consider a resolution to accept this property located at 414 Fairfield Street, and then we'd be able to tear it down. Okay, thank you, sir. Do we have a motion to second? I so move. Second, Mr. Okay. All right, discussion? If not, show of hands, please. It passes unanimously. Mm -hmm. Item 10, approval for short-term initiatives from the South Carolina Urban Land Institute. Mr. LeDuc. Yes, sir. Uh, let me apologize, number one, to start off uh, by apologizing. Uh, Urban Land Institute came here in December. Uh, during the months of January, February, and into February, um, into March, we went back and forth with them because we, we felt they, they should have given us more information and more substance uh, in their report. Uh, but for the last probably six weeks, um, Emory has been after me to go ahead and get this before you. Um, I got involved with the budget over the last little bit. So I, I wanted to go ahead and start the discussion uh, with you on the different initiatives that they're suggesting that we have looked at and we feel are things that council is going to need to start talking about. So tonight I'm not asking you to approve any of these, but to start the discussion and then the city manager could go ahead and have a work session with you, uh, have the representatives, we've got two representatives here from Crawls and Park tonight uh, to start working on some of these short-term initiatives. So let me go through them all. One is to implement a, a rental inspection program. This came before council maybe 10 years ago uh, at that time. We went ahead and required a business license uh, for rental property, but decided not to go through an inspection program of any formal type. If you go forward with this, it's not just for Crawls and Park. You would have to do it citywide. And we think there's a lot of value in that. It would not be for a large apartment complex, but it would be for single family homes uh, for those landlords that own multiple units. Uh, yeah, we don't currently require a business license if you just have one unit. Just one, but if you have two or more, you would. I wonder what they would have thought about that if they were asked. I, it doesn't make sense to me. But. Yeah. The, the inspection program, though, was something that council discussed and decided at that time it was not a program you wanted to have. We still think it's a very valid program and one you might want to consider. But again, I think that's something that council is going to have to look at in a little more detail because it's not just crawls of park specific. You mm -hmm. have to approve this yeah. citywide. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. The next thing is to look at uh, street lighting. When they interviewed the, the various groups that they talked to and individuals, street lighting came up over and over and over again. Um, I have asked Scott Neely with SCENG to come up with a lighting plan uh, so that we could not just say we want more lights, but here's going to be the cost to put those lights in. All the electricity is in the backyard, so any location that we feel additional lighting is needed, and I agree that additional lighting is needed, uh, a wire will have to come between the properties and they'll have to put up a new pole uh, for that light. 
Uh, at the same time, once we get that number, if we're comfortable with it, we can make a comparison and George Grinton and his staff to even look at what would the cost be if we install lights and put in our own wiring you know, and, and make a cost comparison. But we do all feel that we need additional lighting out there. And so more additional information will be coming to council concerning that. Uh, apply for this grant. We did receive the grant. Uh, Emory is going, I think in May, is it Emory? Uh, with Second Baptist and Nehemiah Corporation to the state uh, to get the grant funding and, and get that process started on tearing down all those uh, seven homes that are there and one in Edgewood. And then we'd be selling the property for $20,000 per lot to uh, Second Baptist. And hopefully they'll then build houses out there like they did with DuPont Landing. Mm -hmm. uh, develop a short-term rental program. We felt this was really unique and something that council should consider. Uh, having a police presence in a neighborhood like this is very important. Or secondary, if you can't get the police, get uh, firemen out there, teachers, some professionals living out there. We have a number of properties that are for sale. Uh, we feel taking two or three of them and reducing the rent for public safety, number one, and if you still had houses left over for other individuals you can look at uh, with the idea that that rent could go towards buying the home after the end of one year, similar to what you heard in DuPont Landing. DuPont Landing, uh, after 15 years, they would get a major reduction on the price of the home. Yeah, they were almost private. They almost own the house, given what the house would be worth right. at that time. So we think this would be great for our public safety officers. Again, that's, we think this is one of the more important ones and key ones that we'd like council to consider. Uh, number five is just we need to get more press. The crime is down substantially. It's, it is better, but there's a perception uh, that Carlson Park has still got a lot of problems and a lot of concerns. We need to do a better job in getting information out through various social media to say these are the good things that are happening out there. Uh, number one, we need to do it internally amongst the residents that live there to let them know where the status is on sewer projects, on the lighting projects, if we do the public safety uh, and other information internally, but then we need to do some things externally. Uh, so Emory is working on that. And Emory, come on up here and pipe in whenever you want to. <laughs> Don't let me do all the talking. No piping. Uh, and there, there is some infrastructure. You know, we, we've been putting sidewalks out there. We've been putting curb and gutter out there. Uh, a lot of mount, a lot of areas now have the sewer line in the center. Um, so improvements have been being progressed. Uh, there is still additional areas that need to have improvements. So we need to continue focusing on how do we get that infrastructure improvements there, um, along with that lighting, sidewalks. The safe route to school grant, we think we're just about there, right, George? Uh, every time I ask him, he says, we're that much closer. Uh, we got all the right of way. The final plans are still being studied by the state, and then we should be able to go out for bids and start that, I'm saying, this summer. Uh, and last, uh, how do you measure your success? And uh, Emory and I have talked about this. Somehow we need to get a survey uh, and some baselines as to where we're at today so we could say we've made this type of improvement or that type of improvement. and, and measure our successes, not just in Crosland Park, but throughout the north side uh, area. So those are some of the short-term things. Uh, I really feel like the next step for council, we could discuss a little bit here. I know it's getting late, but more importantly, it's probably important to have a work session. Um, and I don't want to put any timetables on our new manager and, and council, but sooner than later uh, to get us moving. And, I, and again, I'm sorry that the report has come so late, but part of it is ULI and making the changes that we suggested, and then the last part is, is myself. It's not Emory's problem at all. And I, okay. I read the entire report. Stuart was kind enough to send it to me at my. And we'll get you hard copies. I saw yeah. your email today, and, and we'll get hard copies of this to, to council. Good. I think council needs to read the whole thing. Do we need to approve this in any way here? or? Uh, it was more for discussion, um, unless, I mean, if there's certain aspects that you want us to focus in on more than others, we could start doing that. Uh, thank you. All right, well, accepted. I think your idea for a work session is good. Yeah. <clears throat>
the, uh, the, item number four, we have one property out there, and I can't remember the name of the people that have been in it. Five Billy or Ellis. And have we converted that to, to item number four? Where it's, they've been, it's, it's not a short term rental. They've no, been, they, they've been um, on again, off again, and paying the rent. We've had discussions with them. Um, it is, like, like it's had successes and failures along the line with them. <laughs> you know, they're, in, uh, but like they're almost halfway paid for the house or something. If they would have kept up their payments, um, I believe that the gentleman worked at Owens Corning. Um, and of course, they had the layoff and then getting back to work. And it, it's, it's been a trying ordeal to keep them current where they're at. Right. Did somebody have some health problems in that family as well? Or not? Then we have. I don't think so. Okay. It's been more employment issues okay. than anything. But then we have the other four rentals that we ought to be looking at on some of this also. Yeah, and, and we're looking, this program with public safety would be more on here's these new homes. Uh, allow them to rent them with the option to buy at a reduced rate after one or two years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Would this apply to the sheriff's office also? I know it says Aiken Public Safety. Yeah, we'd, we'd start with Aiken Public Safety and then we'd uh, move out to the sheriff. If, let's say we could get one or two individuals enticed to come out there at, at this type of a program. Uh, then council might want to consider what about individuals that are fire? Uh, what about teachers? What about public works employees? Getting individuals out there that would make a difference is, is essentially, but we'd like to start with public safety. So we got to make them aware of that, all of the- Well, I think council needs to discuss this and, and so make sure forth. you're comfortable with the first before we go ahead and advertise it. Mm -hmm. And so again, we, we could get a work session scheduled on this sometime in the near future. And I, I thank Mr. Yant and Dale Couch for being such active members of the association. And uh, Norman Dunnigan came out from Dumpster Depot last week and had a meeting with them. And he has some uh, plans for working with uh, the residents of Crosland Park. And we'll be announcing those soon because he's really interested in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so am I. Excellent. Do you have any initial questions of these items that we have here? Other than it's late? Oh, well, they're all good ones. Okay. They're all good ones. We can, Hold on. we can put them in the order. Of and Emory and is ready to move forward on any and all of these. <clears throat> okay, item 11 approval of full resolution of money purchase plan for our city manager. Uh, in, the, in the contractual agreement that we have, the city manager. Uh, we had agreed to allow his investment uh, for pension to be outside the city system. Uh, he has asked that the ICMA, uh, International City Managers Association, uh, would be the preferred area for him. And they are requiring a resolution, which has been reviewed by our pension attorney and our attorney. Uh, everybody agrees it's, it's fine. And so we're asking tonight for your approval of this resolution for the retirement plan for the city manager, the new city manager. Okay. Do we, the only city manager. Do That's we right. Move, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> uh, I second. <laughs> Do we have a motion and a second? So move. I second. Okay. Any discussion? If not, show hands, please. All in favor? Passes unanimously. Okay. Next one is approval of May meeting schedule. I assume everybody wants to meet on Memorial Day, right? I move that we don't <laughs> meet in the second Monday. I'll second this. Okay, you got a second. <laughs> okay, show of hands for approval. Pass this unanimous. And we have two items we added. And the two items we added, and uh, remind me of what they were. Poultry. One of them was just to get an update on, on uh, how, so that the uh, the neighborhood will know what's going to happen to their uh, the streets out there. Or the, the cave the in of the truck, Mr. Mayor, at Moultrie Ave. Yeah, we have uh, George, and and then I. We've also asked Rick Tool. Rick Tool is out there. If you both want to come up here and give us a just short, but Rick was out there actually there. within a, a foot or two of the truck um, when it did fall through, <laughs> and so he obviously is very close to it. Yeah, okay. Almost too close, hmm. and. They have televised the uh, the line, and so they could go ahead and give you a report. 
Yes, uh, uh, Rick uh, Tool, as uh, uh, we uh, hired him to uh, work with us with the uh, soil uh, boring uh, contractor uh, so that we uh, could get the results, evaluate them, and so um, uh, that's why Rick was, was involved in that. Um, I guess it was about a week ago, Monday, following previous week, uh, we had, uh, uh, Rick and uh, Reed and myself had met to review the roads and it was the uh, Wilhelm engineer recommendation that we do a uh, proof roll to evaluate some of the cracked patched areas that were showing you know continued signs of failure or growth and uh, I went on vacation um, late Tuesday night and uh, I'd left it actually with Rick to arrange with with our supervisors uh, to, you know, to arrange for the proof rolling, which I think Thursday they decided that they would be able to do it that Friday. So that was all just fine. And then I'll turn it over to Rick at that point because he was standing right beside the vehicle when it was uh, going through the questionable area. Actually, the area wasn't a particularly an area of concern that it was riding on. No, it really wasn't. Um, the proof rolling actually, Mr. Mayor, you thank, thank, closer to the mic. Well, thank you for well, being here. Uh, Greg, quite welcome. It'll pick you up. Okay. Um, Wilmer Engineering had requested a proof rolling to initiate uh, their services so that we could try to identify what was going on overall. The idea of a proof roll is to see what kind of movement you may have in a pavement surface, particularly if there's some concern that there's failed portions. Uh, once you identify those, what we were hoping for, that they were isolated areas, we have 20 borings that were budgeted for the process, and what we'd like to do is concentrate those borings in areas where they were concerned. So the proof rolling, we were in hopes, would isolate some areas and we could focus our borings on those areas. So we were proof rolling both the outside and the center of the, uh, of the roads. Uh, we had uh, completed the proof roll of the outside of the north side of Moultrie, uh, we come back through the south side, went up Huron, turned around and came back, back to Moultrie, and we were heading up Moultrie. Uh, the garbage trucks had been there that day, so garbage cans and some of the debris from the storm on Monday were in the street. So the, uh, the gentleman driving the um, dump truck had to move out into the middle a little bit, which we would have got coming back down on a third pass. Uh, and when he did, um, I was about a foot from the tire. I was watching, he was moving in an area that had some uh, cracking near the surface and it was moving to a patch and I wanted to see if there was, what the deflection difference was between the area that had not been patched and the area that had been patched. And I, I watched it collapse right there. I got out of the way quickly. Um, well, was this area patched? This area was not patched. Well, right? it had to, if, when they uh, broke it away, there was three inches of asphalt there. Okay. So evidently they had done something to the area in the past, but it was adjacent to an area that had been recently patched. Okay. Um, uh, you know, it collapsed very quickly and it was obvious that the three inches of asphalt was actually all that was there. I only got a split second view of it going in and you could tell it was a void. Uh, so we tried to get the driver out as quickly as possible and um, try to keep cars from getting in there. The area was located along the sanitary sewer line um, and it was just above a storm sewer culvert that crosses the road. I'll try to answer any questions you want. We tell, tell us what happened there. Why, why was that sinkhole or that hole there? Um, you know, when the, uh, when, the, when the event occurred, I uh, immediately went to one of the downstream storm sewers, pulled the top to look in it, and there was a substantial red color. We have photos of, of the red color. So uh, there was obvious, there was water moving through the system into the storm sewer system um, as soon as the collapse occurred that caused the discoloration of the groundwater. Uh, so we checked the uh, trap on the north side of the road where water comes down uh, Moultrie and then crosses Moultrie. So coming down Moultrie, the water was clear, but where it crossed coming out the other side, it was muddy. So we knew that there had to be some type of disruption in the storm sewer system that allowed uh, the material to be moved. Uh, one of the problems you have with storm drain pipe and even sanitary sewer, if you have a problem with a joint or you have a hole in the pipe, 
and you have a lot of water movement, it can suck the material from around the pipe and above the pipe. It will eventually migrate down and it'll leave a void. And it starts slowly, um, right at where the joint's at or wherever the, the break in the line is. As water moves through that joint and into it, it carries a little bit of soil. And over time, that void cre creeps back upstream to the source of the water. And in this case, it followed the, um, the sanitary sewer backfill. That was the weakest uh, of, of material. In situ soil has a structure that kind of inhibits that a little bit. But when you go in and compact material, um, it's, you've changed that structure. So as water moves through it, it's able to collect little bits and pieces of soil. So with time, and it could take you know, anywhere from months to years uh, to develop, you have a, a hole that actually develops and creeps back upstream towards the source of the water. In this case, it had come underneath the edge of the, of the surface of the pavement about where the truck had uh, collapsed. The, the pictures that were taken uh, immediately after removing the truck show the soil structure around it. So it, it was an isolated area, but the, the actual hole extends from where that uh, truck went in and it goes kind of deeper as it moves towards uh, maybe 50, 60 feet down, uh, down the hill towards the storm sewer pipe. That's why you coned off so much of it. I'm sorry? That's why you ran the cones so far down the hill. I, I didn't see the cones. I'm sorry, I didn't see those afterwards, but I had suggested that they start yeah. down below the, uh, the storm yeah, sewer line did. and then they go did. up above. Yeah. Uh, so what has been done? Uh, I, I don't know. The hole is what, still sitting? No. Yeah. What, um, what has been done at this point is we filled up the, uh, the hole that was there with the crush, uh, with um, stone, mm -hmm. compacted it, and it is you know, now at, at surface level. Okay. Um, I believe uh, Roger uh, asked that um, Gall and Kistner repair the road within seven days. I have actually talked to um, their uh, contractor, B&K Paving, and they're trying to understand you know, what, what's wrong, what needs to be done. And um, so I was, I have not had the chance to consult with Rick. Um, so we were going, I, I have the question of, um, you know, do we want to complete our testing um, of, of, you know, the other road before we do this repair? Of course, we're really just talking at this point, repairing a, another patch, as it were, over this particular hole. There still is the issue of, you know, probing around the hole. Um, evaluating all the soil just as you know we were trying to do and we were starting the process. And the defect in the soil itself. Um, yeah, uh, we have videos um, that um, I, I'm going to share with, with, uh, with the, the, the paving companies and, uh, and anybody who wants to look at it. Um, the, there's a fair amount of water actually still running from on Friday uh, from the groundwater into the stormwater, um, which is, uh, there's a failed uh, joint going up Moultrie from the uh, 1177 um, house where the catch basin is. If you go up the street, there's a joint that has the gasket that is blown out. And then if you go transverse across the road, there's actually, a, a, I think it's, it's, well, it's 21 feet from the side. It's, it's possibly the last joint before the, it enters the catch basin and you know goes further out on the other side. <laughs> that has actually got a significant amount of water coming in. And when we walked up there with um, the uh, Mr. Owens, uh, you could hear water, and we looked and we could see water coming in. Um, we went upstream, you know, to other uh, sewer manholes and. Um, storm sewer manholes and there's no water coming in so it seems to be you know collecting down from from the hill yes well have those yeah. storm sewer and, and sanitary sewer lines already been deeded to the city no yes uh, sanitary is but storm is not there, there's two issues and there's kind of answer your question answer your question number one we have a failed storm drainage system out there uh, Gall and Kistner was sent a letter stating that they have seven days to get started on the repairs for these or to indicate they're going to get started within a couple of days of that or we'll go out there and fix it and then we'll build them. That's the repair of the storm drain. The bigger issue once that's resolved is we still need to immediately 
and I mentioned this to Rick on Friday, we need to get that testing done. Uh, this is more expediently than we're even doing it right now so that we could then determine exactly what is the other problem, the road itself. So th there, storm drainage is one problem, then the road's the other problem. That's and right. until we get the soil borings, we really don't know what else needs to be done with the road. And we may find some other things when we do that. But the immediate thing is get the storm drainage. If they don't get started on it, then we'll go ahead and do it ourselves and we'll build them for it and that's what the, the letter but, states. But just because I got different answers there. Storm drains are still owned by Colin Kisner. Yeah. We own the water lines, the sewer lines, the storm drainage line is owned by Gall and Kisner. Okay. Uh, well, so it's their responsibility. If they don't do it quickly though, we can't wait for them and, a month from now. We need to get it done. And, and I have talked with, Ms., uh, with Mr. Gall. He said that they were actually, they and B and K has contacted me the, they plan to start immediately. What what concerns me, and this can be held over to a later discussion, is we don't own the roads, but we consistently make a good faith effort uh, to do the repair work uh, for the health and safety of the neighborhood uh, with these road repairs. And uh, the concern that I have is how much how much does this affect us in terms of getting this work done for the health and safety and for the community if, if we don't own the roads and, and Gall and Kistner uh, remains. Well, that's, that's why the letter that went out said that they will be billed if they don't fix it themselves. Okay. And I called uh, Steve Kistner on Friday and told him that. Okay. Which is why you got the response on Monday. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to why we were there to begin with and ask you a couple of questions, Rick. 20, uh, is 20, whatever you call them, because I'm the non-engineer on council, is 20 things that you put on the ground, is that enough? Well, that's an excellent question, uh, Councilman. <laughs> I, I have instructed the um, uh, soils <laughs> investigation group based on what we observed to lay out a boring scenario that he felt was necessary in order to adequately evaluate the pavement okay. uh, throughout the roads. And then if it were more than 20, then I would bring that back. Okay. He, I have met, I, well, I had a conference call with him this morning. Uh, he promises my boring layout preliminary locations this week so I can provide those to George and he can share those with you and anybody who's interested. Uh, once they are submitted, if, if everybody's okay with the, with the way the borings are laid out and if we need additional um, background information of why certain locations, I'll be happy to discuss those. Uh, they will contact the underground utility locate and they require three days in South Carolina to uh, uh, provide location of all underground okay. utilities. The borings will be shifted then based on whatever utility conflicts exist. Uh, once that is completed, we are scheduled right now to begin our borings on the week of May 18th. Um, it'll take two to three days to complete the borings. I'll just give you the whole schedule and I'll answer any of the questions. Yeah, okay. Um, then the uh, lab testing will require approximately two weeks after the borings are completed. And about two weeks after the lab testing, He'll have his preliminary uh, data review. So by the end of June, we should have our report uh, prepared to uh, provide to council. Mr. Decker from Gem Lakes was left with the impression that he was going to be involved in this process from beginning to end. And he was quite frustrated to see the city out there, not does not for you, Rick, to see the city out there doing some preparatory testing uh, to determine where they were going to do the, uh, 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 the boring samples. and. Um, we, we just need to keep him in the loop. I mean, this. Well, I keep the city manager in the loop, and then well. if he chooses to share that with others, then, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have instructions specifically to call Mr. Decker and, and, and you know, have him um, present in all our, our studies. In fact, we didn't really even consider the proof role and the walking, that was all preliminary just to, to I, decide yeah. where to go. And the plan I had was when Rick provided me with the, um, the, the boring locations and the explanation why, I would provide that to the city manager and then we'd okay. share it however it needed to be shared, whether it was with council. Um, you know, if, if it needs to be approved by council, I'll bring it to council. Um, I, I would whatever. suggest, John, you try to meet with Mr. Decker 
and uh, he is literally an expert on the issue of roads in Gem Lakes and has studied it for a long time. Yeah. And we owe him that, that courtesy. Yeah. He was under the impression yeah. that and, and, he was going to be He is old. correct. I, I did tell him that when we got ready to start the testing, we would give him the schedule. We, running a truck up and down the road, we didn't think would consider testing. Now, again, I think he thought it was, but yes, we, the whole idea was we were just going to run a truck up and down the road. We were going to do no testing whatsoever. Once we got that information, then we're going to supply it to okay. him. And so when we, we still will get a uh, boring plan, and we'll have discussions, and we'll provide that to whoever's interested in seeing it. Okay. This, this, uh, we, we just need to stay on this, uh, on this issue with this road until we get a handle on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rick, did you... See? Did you say that all the roll proofing has been done or there's still some to be done? I think we have enough information to, to lay out the boards. Uh, I don't know that we need to do any more proof rolling. Oh, okay. Right. It, it was strictly to give us an idea. <laughs> to be quite honest, what we were looking for were um, areas that may exhibit similar characteristics with the proof rolling so we could say this area is fine. We don't need to put borings in here okay. or if we do it's a uh, maybe a foundational boring to give us an idea of what it should look like we don't uh, think there are any more weak weak areas well uh, now that's a different but the what we experienced with the failure that's a totally separate than the general roadway condition that was um, that was a result of, of workmanship of on a Santa, on a storm sewer line. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that could happen anytime, anywhere, where there may be a high groundwater level. One of the significant things that did uh, show up as a result of the uh, failure of the road, once they pulled the truck out, groundwater was only three feet below the surface of the road. That is a significant concern on the overall. Um, uh, sure performance sure. of the road yeah because within three feet water is going to have a, um, a degradatory effect on, on your total pavement structure yeah. but, the, but the, the collapse itself was related to a specific yeah. cause which was a storm drain that had a, a, a faulty uh, joint I'm, yes sir. I'm, I'm a little confused I saw the photographs and I saw that water if there's storm sewer right there it had a point, a leak point in it. Why wasn't that water going right out of that storm sewer pipe? Then why would it still be standing there? It, it, it's moving, and it's moving that way. It's just moving slowly. If you look how much water's coming out, there's a lot of groundwater moving through that area. Obviously, <clears throat> now when we do the borings, we'll be looking at those groundwater elevations, um, both You're during okay. the boring That's and 24 new. hours afterwards. Uh, to try to see what those groundwater elevations look like. Sure um, there's a lot of conditions, subsurface conditions, that could lend itself to having high groundwater tables. Uh, the indication by Mr. Decker telling me that there was a lot of kaolin found in that area. Uh, well, kaolin is a water carrier. I mean, it, it just rides on top mm -hmm. of yeah. it. Mm -hmm. uh, so with the amount of rain that we've had, if groundwater uh, tables or, or levels are fully recharged, it could be a lot of water moving through. And it's going to generally trend along the same contour as the surface. So if the surface is sloped, the groundwater generally slopes with it. So it's going to move downhill as well. And in this particular case, you know, it's moved downhill. The uh, sanitary sewer is bedded in stone, uh, open stone, mm -hmm. and so is your uh, storm sewer. So when it's bedded in stone and that uh, groundwater finds that stone, it runs like a river through it. Yep. Uh, but when it hits a wall of dirt or soil, it dams it up. So it, you know, it kind of goes back to its normal percolating. Um, so you may have it kind of build up like a wave and then hit a, uh, uh, a dam, if you will, under, underground. Mm -hmm. And then it moves back into its normal mm -hmm. um, oh, movement patterns, which okay. are slowed down by the soil itself. George, uh, as you go up Huron, up to the top area, and maybe you've noticed it. I don't see how anybody could not notice it, that there's some road decay up there that is terrible. Yes, sir. It's worse than it was a couple years ago when we saw it, and it was bad then. But And that was kind of the purpose of the proof rolling is to, okay. we're looking for good and bad spots so that we can compare and determine whether everything's bad. Uh, we know 
where we think some are bad and proof rolling was going to show how bad was bad and if there were other areas. So that whole area has been surveyed. Um, I guess the one question I was going to ask is whether did we complete the proof rolling and did you have any more? We, we did not complete, but I believe we have enough information to do the more and layout. So, so that kind of answers the, the, that question. I guess my point, too, is uh, Gall and Kisner need to get to work on that part. Well, think. that's what the uh, borings will tell us uh, no, how no, they need to work on it. Oh, okay, so you're, you're aware of it and they will know that, yes, sir. that because it's a terrible spot. Mr. Mayor, we understood. We, we, we identified that, okay. and that area will be included in the boring layout. Okay, good. Thank you. And there's some other areas that um, they haven't done any of the repairing. The section that's closest to Lakeside, where after Huron and Moultrie have joined, there's a section where they, that was the last area that they were doing their building. Right. And they um, had said that they would wait until all that construction was completed, mm -hmm. then they would go back in and fix mm -hmm. that. And that's another area that needs to be repaired. I think generally speaking, though, those patches are holding pretty well. Some of them. Some, some of them. Some of them. There's mm -hmm. some that need work, but. Some areas look decent, and other areas, they mm -hmm. continue to have problems. That's what we were hoping the boring, well, we were expecting the no. boring to tell us why. No. I think okay. the failure that you see in the water running in there is quite common, not only in that area, but in Woodside. We've had it over in Springstone, and we've had it also uh, in Stratford Hall. And it's the same type of failure uh, where the groundwater is, is uh, the, mm -hmm. the normal path of the groundwater has been interrupted. Therefore, it finds the easiest place to go, just like you said. <laughs> And unless it's bedded properly with stone or whatever so the water can get out, the hydraulic load backs up and it just pushes the whole thing out of the way. Uh, the road just down from me, uh, they did the same thing. They didn't drain the water out. It took it about three years and the hydraulic load built up and pushed out about 1,200 yards. So, I mean, uh, we need to find out where the water is going. If they have to bed rock along it, we're going to have to do that. Otherwise, it will just continue to fail. Is that because we didn't core test on some of those roads? Uh, no, when you're digging in the road, and, and the guys digging the road knew it, I mean, you can dig through there and you can see where the water's running. Yes, sir. Uh, and there, there's a, a quite well-recognized geologist for this area lives there, and uh, he can pretty well point out where the water's coming in above the lakes, and it, the, the strata runs out right, right through that road. So we do have a, a water flow, and it takes about three or four weeks after a rain to get down there, sometimes six weeks if it's a, a light rain. But it transfers itself in about three to six weeks. Uh, Ascot is the same way. Uh, it, it'll rain, and three or four days later, water's coming up out of the street. Yes, sir. Okay, based on Phillip's request, uh, let me read this. We need to go into executive session. Um, we need a motion to go into executive session to discuss negotiations incident to proposed construction con contractual arrangements. Contractual arrangements and uh, proposed sale of purchase of property. Proposed sale of purchase of property. Before we so, go, so Mr. Mayor. And uh, do we have a motion to second? Second, Mr. Mayor. Huh? Before we go into executive session, I'd just like to say uh, All right. I was speaking with the executive director of the uh, Property Owners Association of Woodside, and they really appreciate Tim Coakley and his crew's actions. They came out timely. They uh, helped cut the uh, lumber, so to speak, and uh, the people really appreciate it. And I understand they're not going to send us a bill. Oh, that, that's that's even better. <laughs> Thank you, Tim, <laughs> and your crew. <laughs> okay, I need a motion and second to go in the session. I move that we go. In. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. All at a time, please. I move that we go into that executive session as you read it. Okay. I second. You second. Okay. Show of hands to go into executive session. Then. Okay. Pass this. I assume the new city manager. Second. Yeah. Council has returned from uh, from. Uh, Executive session and uh, no voting took place. We had a discussion and now we need a uh, motion and second to come out of executive session. So move. Second. Okay. Show of hands. 
All approval. Passes unanimously. Thank you.